All right, good morning, everybody. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Uh, ho hopefully you guys can. <laughs> Let me just uh, start up the video to just two seconds. All right, I guess that works, perfect. Move this over to the other side. So I hope that you guys are all <laughs> doing well. Uh, Canada finally got cold again, as you guys know. So <laughs> it's been a little bit uh, less fun than usual. But uh, the nice thing about winter semester, the thing about winter semester I always love is that it starts getting lighter each morning. So, of course, if we look outside, it's dark and gloomy. But by, uh, by the end of March, it'll be nice and light out by 8 a.m., which is great. All right. So I'm going to address uh, a couple of questions first of all regarding Mathematica. So I'm going to pull up E-Class here and as you guys know we had assignment one and it's due today at 12 o'clock. So when you guys finish your assignment just create a nice PDF, go to assignment submissions over here and then there's a nice drop box where you guys can submit your first assignment. All right so that's going to be assignment number one again due today at noon and then of course we have assignment two which I'll go over today and don't worry assignment two is going to be uh, nice and easy. So I'm just going to try and adjust this right here just a little bit. All right, so another thing I wanted to discuss really quick was just Mathematica files because they kind of suck to download, right? So if you go to uh, an example with Mathematica file, the way to save it is you right click it and you go save link as. Now it's kind of confusing because it's it's not really a link, it's a file, but if you go save link as, you can specify wherever you want to save it, so I'll just save it wherever. And then the Mathematica itself, uh, the Mathematica file itself downloads, and you guys will be good to go. So uh, uh, hold on one second, I just have a question. So for Nathan, Nathan has a question regarding this class and using Mathematica. And what happens is a lot of the assignments in this class, Nathan, uh, they're a little bit difficult to do by hand. So I show you guys how to solve these types of questions in Mathematica. I find Mathematica best for these specific types of questions. However, you guys are not limited to Mathematica. If you guys are experts in MATLAB and you guys want to solve the assignments through MATLAB, by all means, go ahead. If you guys are feeling particularly brave and you guys want to solve it by hand, again, go ahead. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not here to stop you, but as you guys are going to see once we start talking about today's lecture, it's going to get... Uh, pretty difficult to solve by hand. All right, so that's kind of why we use Mathematica. But again, you guys aren't limited to Mathematica. Use what uh, whatever software you guys feel is the best to solve uh, to solve these problems. All right. So, is there any questions before we get started today? Today is fun. You guys have survived the boringness of linear algebra. You guys have conquered solid mechanics review. Now we're going to get into the good stuff, the juicy stuff, which is uh, approximation methods. So, any questions before we begin? Are you guys uh, you guys feeling pretty good? Hopefully, pretty good. Perfect. I'll take the lack of silence as uh, as, as a good thing, <laughs> even though it usually means the exact opposite. All right, guys, so again, we're on lecture number three out of 10, so time's going by pretty fast. And the topic of today's lecture is approximation methods. So the reason why we went into solid mechanics and the reason why you guys had that assignment one there was to show you guys when we're dealing with these exact solutions, two things happened. One is to get our differential equation we had to make a lot of assumptions. Remember Euler-Bernoulli beam theory? We had to make a lot of assumptions just to get a differential equation. Now, it sucks in that our result was a differential equation. So if I want the exact solution to something, we need to solve a differential equation. All right, so that's kind of the whole basis here. If I want the exact solution, I need to solve a differential equation. Now, as engineers, we say, well, that could be pretty complex, pretty time consuming. It's not impossible most of the time, but uh, it's, it sucks. We don't want to have to solve a differential equation. So the question becomes, how can we try to approximate this differential equation? Because again, if we're designing a building, again, we're engineers, we want to design something. If we can approximate something with good accuracy and save us all the trouble of solving that differential equation, well, we're pretty happy. You know, we, we get the answer that we're looking for without the work, which is uh, one of the things that we want to do. Now, when it comes to approximating, there is a bunch of methods. There is a bunch of methods. You guys probably already know this. And in this lecture, I'm going to cover four of them. All right. So the first two methods, the Rayleigh-Ritz method and the virtual work method, this is going to be the basis for assignment number two. So by the second half of this lecture, you guys will be good to go for assignment number two. I will show you guys. It shouldn't be a problem at all. After that, we're going to get into something called the point collocation method, as well as the method of residual 
uh, weights or the weighted residual method. Now those two are a little bit different, <laughs> if you will, and I'll show you guys why. And we're not going to be, uh, they're not going to appear on the assignments. However, the weighted residual method is going to be very important once we start talking about the finite element formulations. So I know that this class is finite element method, and we have yet to discuss the finite element method, but next lecture, I promise you guys, next lecture, we'll be discussing the finite element method, and we're going to be using these approximations all the way. So let's start off with perhaps the most simple, and that is the Rayleigh-Ritz method. So as we mentioned, the problem with those exact solutions is we need to solve a differential equation. So for instance, I have two differential equations here. The one on the left, that's a differential equation for a bar element. So if I were to have a, a bar and just load it uniaxially, that'd be my differential equation. The second one, as you guys probably know very well because of your assignment, is the differential equation of Euler-Bernoulli beams. And again, in essence, the problem, we have to solve a differential equation. We don't want to solve a differential equation. So what the Rayleigh-Ritz method does is it provides a way of approximating these solutions without the requirements of solving that differential equation, and it's based on minimizing the potential energy of the system. So the key here that I want you guys to take away is that we are now approximating things. We're not getting the exact solution. Sometimes we may end up with the exact solution, but it's more a coincidence rather than the normal. All right, so again, we're approximating things. This is a question that uh, a lot of students fall victim to when they ask, what is the Rayleigh-Ritz method? Uh, sometimes the students will say it's an exact solution method. It is not. Again, we are now in the realm of approximation. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we minimize that potential energy. So the question becomes, what is the potential energy? Well, it's actually very simple. It's simply the total strain energy of the system, which is represented as that integral of uh, u bar and then minus the work done on the system so again we have that internal strain energy and we have the work done by external forces so in essence it looks very simple but we do have a lot of questions that we want to try and answer why minimize the potential energy how do we calculate that internal strain energy and the work done and how do we minimize this potential energy? So again, it looks very simple, but the process is a little bit confusing. So let's try and answer some of these questions. The first thing that we're going to look at, what does potential energy mean in terms of equilibrium? All right, so potential energy of a system is related to the stability of a system. Okay, so this is going to be the key here. We want something that's going to be stable. Let's take this classic example. If you guys go to any textbook with stability, you guys will always see this figure. So let's say that I had a ball inside this nice curved surface here. I take that ball, I move it a little bit to the side, and I let go. Well, of course, the ball is going to roll back to its original equilibrium position. All right, so this is the key here. It's going to return to the, uh, its original equilibrium position. And in this particular case, we say that the potential energy is minimum, and this is a stable equilibrium, okay? The second scenario that we have is if we have a flat surface. Well, if this is the case, I take my ball, I move it a little bit to the left in this case, and the ball just stays there. It doesn't move again, so it's found a new equilibrium position. In this case, we say that the potential energy of the two systems there are going to be the same, and we call this neutral equilibrium. The final case is if we have a surface that's uh, curved the opposite way, and we have the ball on top. If I were to move that ball to the left, well, of course, it is simply just going to roll off. So this right here is kind of a problem. This is when the potential energy is a maximum, and we call this unstable. So one of the conditions that this would be that you guys probably know of in design would be buckling. All right, so buckling is probably the most uh, common source of instability that you guys have seen. So it's something that's very easy to picture. Now, of course, when we're designing something, we want a nice stable equilibrium, a nice stable solution. We don't want something that's unstable. If you guys are designing buildings and all the columns start buckling, well, that's probably not a very good thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this to our advantage, and in the Rayleigh-Ritz method in particular, we are going to try and solve our uh, differential equation on the basis of trying to keep a stable equilibrium, because again, that's what we want. All right, so how do we do this? Well, again, we said that we have to calculate two components. The first one is the total strain energy of the system, and the second one is the work done by the external forces. So the first one we're going to look at, 
and probably the more complicated of the two is that internal strain or deformation energy. So in general, the strain energy density, which is that U bar that we found in the integral, it's simply computed as the area under the stress strain curve. So if I were to look at a nice stress strain curve for sigma ij, epsilon ij, let's say we get this type of behavior. Well, what this means is that the strain energy density is actually going to be the integral of that curve. So it's just going to be the area under that curve. Therefore, our strain energy density is simply the integral from 0 to epsilon ij of sigma ij. It says sigma 1, 1, but I meant sigma ij with respect to epsilon ij. All right. But for us, we actually have something very nice in this course in the fact that our materials are linear elastic. Now, since our materials are linear elastic, they have that nice linear stress strain curve. Therefore, the area under this curve, well, it's simply a triangle. Therefore, the strain energy density is simply one half of sigma ij multiplied by epsilon ij. So, so far, it's actually looking pretty good. Now, the one thing that will get a lot of students is if we look at this, this would just be the response in one direction. So let's say that this was sigma 1, 1 and epsilon 1, 1. So basically the stretching in the E1 direction. Well, we know that in 3D we actually have multiple components. We don't just have sigma 1, 1. We have sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, etc. So if we consider all the components, our strain energy density is simply going to be 1 half of epsilon 1, 1 times sigma 1, 1 sigma 2, 2 times epsilon 2, 2, sigma 3, 3 times epsilon 3, 3, etc., etc. All right. Now, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that this is our strain energy density. This isn't our total strain energy. And it makes sense because how do we get density? Well, all we need to do is really integrate over the domain. So if we look back at our potential energy equation, we had the integral of this strain energy density over the domain. So what we can do is we can say, all right, I now know what that uh, strain energy density is. It's just the summation of sigma ij, epsilon ij, divided by 2. And all I need to do is integrate this over the domain. Now, this becomes a little bit of a problem because if we integrate over the deformed domain, because again, if we look at this equation here, we're integrating with respect to the deformed configuration. Well, we don't really know that deformed configuration. So if we look at our integral limits in this equation, we can see that they actually shift. The proper equation uses the deformed domain. Again, the problem is we don't really know what that deformed domain looks like. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to integrate this formula with respect to the reference domain. Why is this possible? Well, because we're assuming deformation. So the difference between the deformed, uh, sorry, the deformed domain and the reference domain is actually assumed to be negligible. All right, so this is going to be the first component that we're looking for. And again, this is for a continuum. So this is the most general case. Luckily for us, in this particular course, we're more interested in beams. As we're going to see in the finite element method, we'll go back to continuums later. But for right now, we're mainly concerned with Euler Bernoulli beams. And the total strain energy of a beam is, can actually be derived as a specific case of a continuum. So remember that continuum, that formula we just had, that is the most general sense. We can apply that in any scenario. However, we're going to apply it to our specific scenario of Euler Bernoulli beams. So what we do is we take our formula right here and we look at the components. So this uh, strain energy density, it's a function of two things. One, the stress component, sigma ij, and two, the strain component, epsilon ij. Now, if we remember back to Euler Bernoulli beams, we only had one non-zero strain component. We only had epsilon 1, 1. Remember that epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 2, 3, etc. Those were all equal to zero. Therefore, this equation actually becomes nice and simplified as the integral of sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1, all divided by 2. All right, so it's actually looking pretty good already. We got rid of that summation because all of those terms went to 0 except for one of them. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, sigma 1, 1. And we said, well, if we're ignoring Poisson's ratio and all the other components are equal to 0, well, this just abide by Hooke's law. So therefore, sigma 1, 1 is actually the Young's modulus times epsilon 1, 1. From there, I can see that I have two epsilon 1, 1s. Therefore, I can multiply them together, and I get the integral of e multiplied by epsilon 1, 1 squared, all divided by 2. 
Now from here we say, well, we actually know what epsilon 1, 1 is. We actually derived it in the previous lecture. And we know that epsilon 1, 1 for an Euler Bernoulli beam is negative x2 multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function. So now we're looking even better. And all we need to do now to really create our final expression is integrate over the domain. Now the nice thing for an Euler Bernoulli beam is it's the domain is actually just the volume of the beam. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the triple integral uh, with respect to x1, x2, and x3. So of course I'm just going to input my beam dimensions. I'm going to go from 0 to L in the x1 direction. I'm going to go from 0 to B, so that's that in-plane thickness in the E3 direction. And then for the height of the beam, I'm integrating from negative h over 2 to h over 2. And that's, again, because we aligned our x1 axis through the centroid of the beam. Now what happens here is if we were to say that the cross section of the beam doesn't change, so that's in the x2, x3 direction, this actually becomes the nice integral over the length of the beam of the Young's modulus E multiplied by base times height cubed divided by 24 multiplied by the second derivative of the deflection function squared. Now I know what you guys are all thinking, base times height cubed, well that's a good indication that we're dealing with moment of inertia. Therefore, we can simplify this equation into simply the integral over the length of the beam of EI divided by 2 multiplied by the second derivative of the deflection function, all squared. So much nicer than the continuum case. And this is going to be the hardest component. So if you guys understand this component, you guys are good to go. So again, this was one component. When we're dealing with potential energy, we had two components. The first one is that total strain energy, which we just derived. And the second one was the work done by external forces. Now, this one is extremely simple. You guys are going to love it because the work done by external forces is simply the external force multiplied by the respective displacement or rotation, as you guys are going to see. So when we deal with the general case of continuums, we have two external forces on our continuum or on our particle at any given time. The first one was traction vectors, which we discussed, and these act over the surfaces of our continuum. And the second one is body forces, which act over the volume. So an example of a body force, of course, would be gravity. So even though it looks confusing, well, we just realize it's, it's something like gravity, not too bad. So in this particular case, the work done on the system is gonna be the integral of our traction vector dotted with our displacement, uh, integrated over the surface because again those traction vectors act over surfaces and then we're going to add that to our body force vector times the displacement integrated over the volume all right so again this is the continuum case this is a bit more complicated what we're really trying to figure out in this lecture is Euler Bernoulli beams so Euler Bernoulli beams there is basically three external loads that you guys will ever see the first one is a distributed load Q that acts over the length of the beam the second one is a concentrated load P acting at a specific point. And finally, the last one, which is more rare, is a concentrated moment acting at a specific point. So from here, we can say that the work done on the system is simply going to be the integral of the distributed load times the displacement with respect to x1, plus the summation of any point loads multiplied by their displacement at that respective point, and then plus any concentrated moments multiplied by the corresponding rotations at that point. So it's actually nice and easy. I'm, I'm just going to make a quick adjustment here. Uh, perfect. <laughs> All right, that's a little bit better. I had my camera off way over to the other side. So if it looks like I'm looking out the window, it's just because of the camera. All right, so now if we take a step back, we said the potential energy has two functions or two components, the total strain energy, which we now know, and the work done on the system, which we now know. Therefore, we can actually calculate the potential energy of the system. So the potential energy of the system, as we said, is the total strain energy, which is that integral of U bar uh, over the domain, minus the work done on the system. And we actually have a nice expression because we derived what both that red component and that blue component are. Now, in the case of Euler Bernoulli beams, we can do the exact same thing with the potential energy of the system. It's just going to be equal to that total strain energy, which we calculated as EI divided by 2, multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function squared, and then integrate over the length of the beam, and then minus any external work done on the system. Now, the key here, and this is going to be the key to approximating things, is if we look at our continuum case, 
Well, the only real unknown that we have is going to be that displacement vector u. Because if you think about it, if we were to load something, we know the stresses. And from the stresses, we know the traction vectors. And from the stresses, we can also use our constitutive relationship to find the strains. Therefore, the only real unknown in that equation is going to be the displacement vector u. Similarly, if we look at our Euler-Bernoulli beam, well, we know the external loads. That's something that we're always typically given. You're not usually given the strains of something and then asked to find the external loads. You're usually given those external loads and asked to find the deformation, stuff like that. So if we were to look at this equation, well, the only thing that we really don't know is going to be that deflection function. Why? So it's easy to see where we're going to go with this. If we have an equation with one unknown, <laughs> we're going to try and solve for that unknown. The problem is it's not very clear how we're going to solve for that unknown, that unknown being displacement, of course. All right, so this is going to get into how we start approximating things. So the approximate solution. Now, the first step, as you guys are going to see in any of the methods that we covered today, the first step, which is going to apply for everything, we need to assume something called an approximation function. So typically in this course, as you guys are going to see, this is going to kind of apply to the finite element method too. Uh, we select a polynomial. Therefore, we say we have an approximate solution that's going to be a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared plus dot, dot, dot. Now, the number of terms that you guys include, it's going to be completely up to you guys in the general sense, of course, because in the assignment, I am very clear on how many terms I want you guys to use. Now, why do we add more terms? Well, in general, more terms is equal to a better approximation. Now, when you guys look at your assignments and you guys do your assignment, you guys are going to see that not a lot of terms are actually required to get a very good approximation. However, there's more than one thing that we're going to be approximating, which is going to be the problem later on. All right. So the problem here is if we look at this equation, x1, that's just x1. So that's not going to be a problem. The only unknown in our approximation are those a coefficients, a0, a1, a2, etc. So the whole goal of approximating here is we want to solve for those a coefficients. And that's going to be, again, a common theme across all the scenarios that we deal with today. How can we solve for those a coefficients? Because once I know what a is, I can just substitute it into the equation. I have my approximation. Now, for the Rayleigh-Ritz method, as you guys may have guessed, because we've already talked about it, we're going to solve for these A coefficients by minimizing the potential energy. All right, so we're going to minimize the potential energy, solve for the A coefficients, we're good to go. Well, almost. There's one other thing that we have to consider. These A coefficients, or this approximation function that we have or that we assumed, it has to satisfy essential boundary conditions. So before I go into the process of minimizing that potential energy, I have to ensure that that approximation function that I assumed, it satisfy essential boundary conditions. Or if you guys look in textbooks, sometimes they're called prescribed boundary conditions. Now these are boundary conditions that relate to two things and two things only, displacement as well as rotation. So let's say that I have a cantilever beam and it is subjected to some sort of distributed loading. And I say, all right, I'm going to approximate this with a simple second order polynomial. So my approximation function is going to be a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. Now, if I look at the very left hand side of the beam, I can see that that beam is actually going to be fixed. This implies that we have a boundary condition of displacement as well as rotation. And again, those are going to be essential. Therefore, my approximation function must satisfy those boundary conditions. Therefore, I know that the displacement at x1 is equal to 0 must be 0. Therefore, a0 actually has to be equal to 0. Similarly, the deflection at that point 2 must be equal to 0. Or sorry, the rotation at that point must be equal to 0. So y prime at 0 <coughs> must be equal to 0. Therefore, my coefficient a1 is going to be equal to 0. So if I were to approximate this beam, I can see that before I even got into any sort of minimizing potential energy, I've already solved for two of the A coefficients. Because before we get into that, we always have to make sure that we satisfy those essential boundary conditions. Now, the reason why I keep saying essential boundary conditions a lot is because of this. If we look at the other end of the beam, we know that the moment and the shear at that end of the beam is going to be zero. It's a free end, has no stresses. However, we don't account for that in these essential boundary conditions. Remember, essential boundary conditions are only going to be those related to displacement as well as rotation. 
Therefore, what I do is I take an approximation function, I solve for the essential boundary conditions, and then I update my approximation equation. So my approximation equation now is simply going to be a2 times x1 squared because it satisfies those essential boundary conditions. And after I'm done satisfying those essential boundary conditions, we get into the juicy stuff, which is minimizing that potential energy. All right. And even though it sounds kind of crazy, it's actually really simple because to minimize the potential energy, all we do is sub substitute our displacement approximation into our potential energy equation. So from our last thing, let's just say that our uh, approximation equation was A2 multiplied by X1 squared. And again, this is after satisfying those essential boundary conditions. Well, all I need to do is substitute that into our potential energy equation. Now, even though it looks complex, if we take a step back, well, the only unknown in this equation is A2. Because again, X1 is just going to be X1. EI, well, that's just a property of the beam. Q, uh, P, M, those are external loads. It's no big deal at all. Now, I got a question for you guys in the chat. If we were to look at all the components that we substituted in, we substituted in our approximation equation, or A2 times X1 squared. However, at the very end here, I didn't have A2 times X1 squared. I had the derivative of our approximation equation. Why do we have the derivative at the end there? What do you guys think? This is my excuse to take a water break. <laughs> All right, I heard rotation, and that's exactly correct. So when we multiply moment by something, we don't multiply moment by displacement. We multiply moment by rotation. Now, it's confusing at first because you're thinking, well, I don't have the rotation, but after we approximate our deflection equation, all we need to do is take the derivative of that to attain our approximate rotation <laughs> equation. All right, so this is going to be the general step. And even though this looks really crazy, usually we don't have a lot of concentrated moments. We usually don't have a lot of concentrated point loads. So this is in the most generic form. It is actually much more simple. So next, we're going to minimize that potential energy by taking the derivative of the function with respect to the A coefficients. So this is the key here. We're going to take that potential energy, which is now a function of A2, and we're going to take the derivative of that with respect to A2. Therefore, I'm going to take the partial derivative of this with respect to A2, and we're going to set it equal to zero. Because again, we want to minimize that potential energy. How do we do that? Well, we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero. So the key here is this is equal to zero, which is great because now we have one equation with one unknown. We have an equation, it's equal to zero. Our only unknown in this equation is going to be A2. All right, so now the key here, the thing I want to kind of highlight here is this is if our approximation equation was A2 times X1 squared. But what happens is if we get to this point and we have A2, A3, A4, A5, et cetera, because again, we can add as many terms as we want. Well, all we're going to do is we're going to keep taking the partial derivative of this equation with respect to each A coefficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to A2, set it equal to zero. That's one equation. If I have A3, well, then I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to A3. There's a second equation. If I have a4, I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to a4. That'll be my third equation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it doesn't matter how many a coefficients you guys have at this point, because how, uh, the number of a coefficients corresponds to the number of partial derivatives we're going to take. So therefore, you guys will always have n equations for n unknowns. All right. So this is going to be uh, this is kind of the end of the method. Now I got a question for you guys because you guys are all math experts, right? So we said that we're minimizing the potential energy, and we did that by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero. However, we have to also keep in mind that if we take the derivative of a function and set it equal to zero, we have the possibility of getting a maximum rather than a minimum. So what do you guys think, just in the chat, why do you think that this will always result in a minimum? Because again, there's nothing in here that says check if it's minimum. This will always be minimum. But why? What do you guys think? Any guesses? It's it's nice that it's always minimum because we don't have to do any sort of checks or anything, but why is it always minimum? It's a hard question. It's a very kind of sneaky question. No one likes to talk about it. It's funny because if you guys ever look at any sort of paper or any sort of textbook, <laughs> they always hide the important things. This is one of the things they like to hide. They don't like to talk about it, but this equation will always be minimum 
because, yeah, the second derivative will be greater than zero. But the reason why is because of our restrictions on our material properties. So the reason why this will always be a minimum is because of the, restriction we, the restrictions we have on the Young's modulus and moments of inertia. Our Young's modulus, for example, will always be positive. You guys can't have a negative Young's modulus. So it's because of the restrictions like that on the material properties that this will always be a minimum. Now, that's just a little fun fact. Don't worry about trying to prove it or anything. I just want to show you guys that we will always get the, the minimum potential energy, which is great for us. It means <laughs> less work, and that's always a benefit. So now what we're going to do is I just want to show you guys kind of the general steps when we use this Rayleigh-Ritz method. So the general steps are as follows. The first one that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to select an approximation function. So let's say that I select a0 plus a1x1 plus a2x1 squared. Now again, this is just one of the ones I selected. However, you guys can add as many terms as possible. If you guys want to go all the way up to a10, go ahead. It doesn't matter. And as you guys are going to see when we program it, it's going to be very, very simple to add more terms. Now, the overall goal, of course, is we want to solve for a0, a1, and a2. But before we get into actually solving for those using potential energy, we need to make sure that we satisfy all essential boundary conditions. Therefore, any boundary condition relating to displacement or rotation. So let's just say for fun that it was pinned at x1 is equal to 0. Well, we know that a pin condition does two things. The first one is it limits the displacement to 0. So in this case, our approximate solution at 0 must be equal to 0. Therefore, a0 has to be equal to 0. Now, remember that a pinned uh, support in any other sense would say that the moment is equal to 0. But since moment is not an essential boundary condition, we ignore it completely. So that's why I put pin there just to really emphasize that we only look at displacement as well as rotation. Now that we have updated our approximation to include those essential boundary conditions, we calculate the internal strain energy of the system. How do we do that, Clayton? Well, we have a nice formula in there, where it's equal to EI divided by 2, multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function squared, and then integrated over the length of the beam. So if we look in there, we have no unknowns. EI, that's something that's given. Our approximation equation, well, we have it above. It's going to be a function of those A coefficients. After that, we calculate the work done by the external forces on the system. It's easy. All we do is take the forces, multiply it by their displacements, where the displacements come from, the approximation equation. And then after that, we can calculate the potential energy of the system. So we say that it's equal to that total strain energy minus the work done. And if we take a step back, all well, these two parameters right here, we have no unknowns at this point. Now, of course, they're going to be functions of those A coefficients, but once we get to this, it's not really a problem to calculate. From there, we minimize the potential energy by taking the derivative of that potential energy with respect to each of the A coefficients. So what I would do is I would take the potential energy with respect to A1 is equal to zero, the derivative of the potential energy with respect to A2 is equal to zero, and if I had more coefficients, let's say A3, A4, well, I just keep adding equations by taking derivatives with all of those A coefficients. Now, this will create a number of equations, and all I need to do is solve for the equations. So let's say that I had A1 and A2 as unknowns. Well, all I need to do is take the partial derivative with respect to each. It creates my two equations. I have uh, two equations, two unknowns. I can solve for A1 and A2. So that is the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Now, to really show this off, we are going to do an example. And this is why I love getting to this part of the course is I don't just give you guys a bunch of theory anymore. We can actually do an example together and you guys can see exactly how it works. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this question. Uh, does it look familiar to you guys? You guys, Have you guys seen this question before? Why won't this go? All right, perfect. That goes away. Really, it's method. So what I did is I just opened up a new Mathematica file and we're going to do it together as a, as a little bonding exercise or whatever you want to call it. So is this good uh, size? Can you guys see this all right? Or do you guys want me to increase the size here? I, I can never tell. <laughs> it depends on what screen you guys are viewing from, I guess. But uh, is the size good or do you need me to increase the font size? Size is good? All right, perfect. So as you guys may remember, this was your assignment question. This was from assignment number one. And this sucked. 
Let's be honest. This one sucked. No one liked it because of this right here. This point load right here created a discontinuity. Therefore, to solve this equation, we actually had two differential equations. One for this region of the beam and the other for the second region of the beam. And we had to incorporate boundary conditions. It, it just wasn't fun, right? Like you guys did the assignment. I, <laughs> if you guys came to me and said, Clayton, I had a lot of fun doing the assignment, I'd, I'd say, yeah, right. I don't, I don't believe you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to solve this same question using these approximation uh, methods. And the first one is going to be the Rayleigh-Ritz method. So the first thing, of course, is we need to define the parameters of this beam. So I'm just going to go parameters right here. And we can see that there's actually a number of parameters. So the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to do the length of the beam. And we know that it is equal to 6 meters. That's nothing too crazy, right? 6 meters, L is equal to 6, no problem. I'm going to define a second dimension, which is D, and that is the distance from our support here all the way into our point load. So this D right here, this is going to be the four meters. So I'm going to call this four. Good to go. Other things I can include, well, I see that I have two loads. I have a distributed load over the length of the beam, and then I have a point load uh, at the location D. So I'm going to call my distributed load Q. And we know that this is equal to 45 kilonewtons per meter. And again, it's going downward. So we're going to have negative 45 kilonewtons per meter. Good to go. From here, I can see that I have a point load. I'm going to call this one P. And it's 100 kilonewtons. But again, because it's going downwards, we need to include a negative sign. And then finally, down here, we have some properties about the cross section and the material of the beam, which is the Young's modulus as well as the moment of inertia. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put E is equal to 20 GPA. But now my question for you guys, if I want to keep everything in meters, meters, as well as kilonewtons, so meters and kilonewtons, what should my E be in? GPA, MPA, KPA, PA? <laughs> what do you guys think? Keep it consistent. All right, I heard MPA. I heard KPA. Can someone break the tie? One of those is correct. Who wants? All right. So I hear KPA again. It is KPA. So MPA would be good if I was doing newtons and millimeters. However, in this case, I'm doing kilonewtons and meters. So we're going to put this into 20,000 KPA. Now, again, because the symbol is black, it's mean it's already defined in Mathematica. We have to pick a new symbol. So for the Young's modulus, I just go EM. All right. Because again, E is already defined. And then the second one we have is our moment of inertia. So I'm going to go I is equal to 0 0.003. It's in meters already, which is one of my units. Therefore, I don't really need to convert anything. But again, black symbol. I need to pick something else. So I'm going to go IG. Now, I also do something that uh, you guys will see in all the codes I post. And the reason isn't uh, extremely evident at the beginning, but I'm going to show you guys. So if I were to calculate EI, which is simply... The Young's modulus, oops, <laughs> the Young's modulus multiplied by the moment of inertia, right? We have those both defined. I get a decimal number, a decimal number. However, in a lot of these proofs to make it look nicer, we always want to keep them in fractions. And the reason why this is outputted as a decimal is because one of my inputs is a decimal. So instead of 0 0.003, I'm going to go 3 divided by 1,000. Now, when I do this, I get 60,000, but there's no more decimal. Therefore, if I were to keep all of my parameters like this, where I have no decimals, while all of my outputs, like my approximation function, everything like that, that will remain in fractions, which is great for me because uh, decimals kind of look ugly when we're doing these type of solutions. All right, so there's all my parameters that I'm going to need. We can move on to the next topic, which is our approximation function. So approximation function... And right here, we're just going to define y approximate. So y approx is what I call it. Well, we know this is going to be equal to a naught plus a1 times x1, et cetera, et cetera. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it up to you guys. And you guys be nice. I, I know you guys want to be mean. I gave you guys the mean assignment. You guys want to be mean back. I'm going to let you guys pick the order of the approximation. Now, on E-Class, I've already posted one of the examples, and I did a fifth order approximation. So I went all the way up to a, a5. What do you guys want to go up to? you guys want to do a6, a7? What, what are you guys feeling? My emphasis here is to show you guys that the number of terms we include 
it's actually very, very simple to code it in. So what do you guys want to do? All right, Bryce says A6. Oh, A7. All right, I see A6 again. I got a, a direct message, A6. So we will go up to A6. Now, A6, well, that's probably a good one because if we were to look at your guys' assignment here, which I'm just going to pull up. I don't know where the, the heck it went. Oh, it's over here. Oh, yeah, here it is. This is your guys' assignment, assignment two. And that's simple. We're just solving the beam using the Rayleigh Ritz method as well as the virtual work method. Now, the highest order I ask you guys in the assignment is sixth order. So if I show you guys how to do it, your guys' assignment this week should be extremely simple. But that is something that I want. So let me just pull up the Mathematica file. And I need to pull up uh, the Word document, which uh, <laughs> I think I delete, uh, exited out two seconds. Technical difficulties here. All right. Come on. Why are you not working? There we go. There we go. All right. We're back. So if we do the sixth order, you guys should be good to your assignment. So all we need to do is we just need to keep adding terms until we reach A6. So we got A1X1. We're going to go A2 times X1. Oops. <laughs> keep the X's consistent. Plus X1 squared. Plus A3 multiplied by X1, 3. Then etc. etc. So A4 multiplied by X1, 4. Plus A5. This is the most boring part of it. It's just going on and on. <laughs> I always have to check because this is where I usually make a mistake and then I can't figure out where the heck I make the mistake. Actually, I'll unsuppress it. So if I were to run it, our current approximation is A0 plus A1X1 plus A2 times X1 squared plus A3 times X1 cubed plus A4 times X1 four, et cetera, et cetera. So, so far we're, we're looking pretty good, right? All we did was make our nice approximation function. So I'm going to ask you guys in the chat, because again, we're going to do this together, make it nice and fun. What is the next step that I want to do? We already made it clear that our goal is to solve for these A coefficients. What is the next step that we need to do? Satisfy boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. You guys are doing great. And I got a question. Is there a direct way to know how many terms we need? What do you guys think? Can I just look at a problem and know automatically how many terms I'm going to need? That's a great question. <laughs> six. Usually six will give you a good approximation. The answer is you don't really know. It depends on the problem. So one of the things that we do know is for an ordered Bernoulli beam, it's governed by a fourth order differential equation. Therefore, one of the things I know to get a reasonable approximation I should at least include up to the fourth order. So that's one of the things you guys can do. But that's one of the things we're going to discuss a lot when we talk about finite elements is because in finite element, we do the same thing. It's a little bit different, but we assume an approximation. Now, the validity of that approximation or how many more terms we need to add, that has that's a big part of finite elements. It's trying to figure out, okay, how can I make this as good as possible? So that's something we'll discuss a lot later. So after this, we said boundary conditions. So let's put boundary conditions here. How many boundary conditions do I have on this beam? All right, let me rephrase. How many essential boundary conditions do I have on this beam? Oswald says two. Two. You guys are on the ball. We have two. Remember, essential boundary conditions are only those related to rotation as well as displacement. Now, our end is fixed here, so we know at this location here, it's going to be uh fixed and so no rotation no displacement so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say boundary condition one well this is equal to my approximation equation oops my approximation equation when x1 is equal to zero you're cl saying clayton why did you do that well if i were to do this right here all it does is it takes my approximation equation and substitute x1 is equal to zero why do we do this? Well, we know that at x1 is equal to 0, that this is going to be equal to 0. So it'll be clear uh, in two seconds. So the second boundary condition we have is our approximation equation, or sorry, the derivative of our approximation equation. Oops. We know that we want the derivative when, of course, x1 is equal to 0 again. x1 is equal to 0. And I forgot to unsuppress this. Perfect. So these are these two right here. So it's going to become very, very clear what these are going to be equal to. So what we're going to do down here is we're going to go solve 
And what we're going to do is we're going to solve two equations. First one, boundary condition one, which is the displacement at x1 is equal to zero. We know that's going to be equal to zero. The second one is our second boundary condition, which is the rotation at x1 is equal to zero. Well, we know that's going to be equal to zero too. What are we solving for? Well, we have two equations. Therefore, we can solve for two coefficients, which are a1 and a2. So when I do this now, it automatically solves that a0 is equal to zero as well as a1 is equal to zero. All right. Does that make sense? <laughs> there's not really a beautiful way of incorporating essential boundary conditions. And there's many ways you guys can do it. That's the, the beauty of computer programming. You guys can do it whatever way you like. Now, the last thing I need to do is I just need to store these as variables. And you guys are going to see why this is going to be so nice. So we're going to say that a0 and a1 are equal to a0 and a1 when solution 1. Oops. <laughs> what did I do? I put win-win. That's what I did. All right, perfect. So now this, and the reason why I did this here is because if we look up at our approximation equation, A0 and A1, they're now black, which means that they're defined. We now know what A1 and A2 are. Therefore, our only unknowns are going to be the blue ones. So we have A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. So I'm going to suppress all this because we're good to go. And I'm just going to get rid of those inputs. So after we satisfy the essential boundary conditions, what do we do next? What do you think we should do next? After we do this, the, the world opens up to us. We can do whatever we want. What do you, what do you guys want to do? You, got, you guys don't want to do it? All right, Bryce says internal strain energy. That's a good idea. We know that one of the things that we need in our potential energy is going to be that internal strain energy. So I'll put internal strain energy here, and it's really simple. So if we look right here, our internal strain energy is simply the integral over the length of the beam of EI divided by 2 multiplied by the second derivative of our displacement function and then squared. So if I were to come here and I were to go internal strain energy, which I'll call ISE, why not? We know that this is the integral, which Mathematica is really, or integrate, it's an integral. So Mathematica has a nice function for integrating. It's just simply integrate, square brackets. And this is going to take in two arguments. So I'm going to put one comma here. The first one's going to be, what function do I want to integrate? And then the second part is going to be, what is the domain of this integration? So we'll start off with the last one. We know we want to integrate with respect to x1. And we want to integrate over the length of the beam. Or we want to go from 0 all the way until L. So again, the second argument it's just the domain of that integration. The first argument, well, that is all the stuff up here. So we said that our function is going to be EI divided by 2 and then multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function. So derivative is that D function. And inside, I know I'm taking the derivative of my approximation function. And I want to take the second derivative. So what I do is I go x2, or sorry, x1, comma 2. So this function right here, it says I'm taking the derivative of my approximation function with respect to x1 twice. All right, nice and easy. But then the one thing that you guys have to remember, and this will be the tricky part, is we're actually squaring this at the very end here. It's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty sneaky in that it's not always quite apparent, but we always have to include that little square. So if I were to run this, I get this. And this is why, to answer the question at the beginning, where do we have to use a software well, no, you guys can do this by hand, of course, but <laughs> do you guys want to end up with that? Well, of course not. That that looks like complete garbage. No one no one really wants to do that. That's what's nice about Mathematica or MATLAB is we can solve for that really, really quickly. So now that we did the internal strain energy, it's that simple, just one equation. What else do we need to do? So internal strain energy is good. What are we feeling next? Work? All right, so yeah, work is correct. Because if we look here, our potential energy has two components. The internal strain energy, which we just calculated, so we're good to go, minus the work done on the system. So in order to calculate our potential energy, we, of course, need that work done on the system. So I'm going to come down here, and I'll just call it uh, I'll just call it work. Why not? You guys know what I'm talking about. So the work done on the system has three components. Our distributed load times any point or added to any point loads added to any concentrated moments now the nice thing for us is we don't have any concentrated moments therefore we can get rid of this last term it's basically going to be our distributed load plus our point load because we only have two external loads so the first one's really simple 
we're integrating our distributed load multiplied by our approximation function. So I'm going to go into e great if I can spell, of course. Jeez, I can't spell at all. Integrate. There we go. <laughs> That's why I'm an engineer. I, I can't do English whatsoever. So again, we have two uh, two arguments in our integrate function. Uh, the last one is the easiest. That's going to be the domain. So of course, we're integrating with respect to x1. And we're doing this completely over the length of the beam. So x1 is 0 all the way into L. And what we're integrating, well, the first argument, that's going to be our function. In this case, it's going to be a distributed load Q multiplied by our approximation equation. So it's actually really simple. Q, which we have defined above, multiplied by our approximation equation. Just like that. So that's going to be the first component right there. And as we can see, it, it, it's it's pretty ugly, right? It's, it's pretty ugly. So this is why I don't recommend doing it by hand. Now, the second thing we also have to do is our second component. So actually, to make this easier, I'll just split it up into two components like this. So that was our distributed load and we also have to account for that point load so if we look right here to account for the point load the work done is simply the point load multiplied by the displacement so i'm going to take my point load p which again we defined above up here so we're good to go and we're going to just multiply it by our displacement now is that correct what do you guys think what do you guys think we're all friends here you guys can say it's correct it's not correct it doesn't matter if you guys get the wrong answer. So Oswald says displacement under the load, and he is completely correct. So this displacement here that we multiplied by the point load, this is the displacement at the point load. So specifically, this is our approximation function when x1 is actually equal to d. All right, so if you guys were to just put the p times the approximate displacement, you guys will actually get the wrong answer. It's, it's, it's quite sneaky, actually. But uh, So remember that when we're dealing with these two, the concentrated point load and the concentrated moment, these are the displacement and the rotation at those specific points. It's not the general function. It's at those very specific points. So nice job, Oswald. We're good to go. So if I were to run that, again, looks pretty ugly. So if I were to do the total work, which is simply going to be W1 plus W2, it's very, very ugly, all right? So now we get into the fun stuff. We have our internal strain energy. We have the work done. Therefore, we can calculate the potential energy of the system. Now, this is where everything gets really easy because the potential energy, well, it's simply that internal strain energy minus the work done on the system, right? Nice and easy. If I were to run that, you guys get this. So who's feeling brave and going to do this assignment by hand? <laughs> Hopefully nobody. That, that would, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be fun. So don't do this by hand. As you can see, once we get into sixth order, it gets pretty gross. Now the question is, if we look at this potential energy, we see that we have an A2, we have an A3, we have an A4, we have an A5. Uh, I'm sure we have an A6. Yeah, A6 here somewhere. The goal is now to solve this. And how do we do that? Well, we take the derivative of that potential energy with respect to each of the A coefficients. So after this, I'm going to go I create a section. We're going to minimize potential energy, just like this. And all we need to do is create equations based on taking those derivatives. So what I'm going to say is my first equation is going to be the derivative of our potential energy with respect to A2, right? If I were to run this, I get a nice equation. Now notice that this equation is a function of A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. So there's still a lot of A coefficients. But again, because I have those extra A coefficients, I can keep taking that partial derivative. So what I can do is I can say equation 2 is equal to the derivative of the potential energy with respect to A3. Run it. I get another equation. And what I can do is I can just keep going down the list. So equation 3 is equal to the derivative of the potential energy, this time with respect to A4. Equation, uh, what are we at? <laughs> equation 4 is equal to the derivative of the potential energy with respect to A5. And then we have equation 5 is equal to the derivative of the potential energy with respect to A6. So if I were to run that, I keep getting equations. So does it start making sense on how we're getting our system of equations, how we're actually trying to figure out how to solve for these A coefficients? Because what I just did is I realized that I have five unknowns, 
A1, or sorry, A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. And I just created five equations. So at this point right here, I have five equations for five unknowns. Because keep in mind that we said that this derivative of the potential energy with respect to an A coefficient, we know it's equal to zero because we want that minimum potential energy. So what I can do is I can solve this system. So I'm going to go solve one, which is equal to solve. Now again, solve function takes in two arguments. The first one is what are our equations? And then the second one is what are our unknowns? So our equations, which I'll put in squiggle brackets here, well, we know equation one, which is that partial derivative. We know that's equal to zero. Equation two, equal to zero. Equation three, equal to zero. Equation four, equal to zero. And finally, equation five is equal to zero. So now this is why I said it doesn't really matter how many terms you guys are asked. Once you guys code it, it's very easy to add or delete terms. All I would do to add terms is just add more partial derivatives. If I wanted to delete terms, I just delete some of these equations. It's, it's very simple once you guys have it. Five equations, we can solve for five unknowns. So we want to solve for a2, a3, a4, a5, as well as a6. So if I were to run this, I now have all of my a coefficients. Very, very nice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store them as variables. So I'm going to go a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6 are equal to <laughs> a, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6, when solution 1, have 1. Therefore, I have these. Now, this is great because if I were to go to my approximation equation, all of my a coefficients are now black, meaning that they are defined. Therefore, if I were to just type in my approximation equation, I have my approximate displacement equation. And that is the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Nice and easy, right, guys? How are you guys feeling about it? Pretty pretty good? Now, what I'm going to do before we get into questions really quick is I'm going to pull up the example on E-Class, if I can figure out where I put it, of course, right here. So this was what you guys have on E-Class. Again, I did five terms on E-Class, so if I were to run this, I have my approximate displacement equation. And if I were to compare it to the exact equation, so I have both the approximation and the exact right here, they're basically the same. So for five terms even, you guys get a very, very good approximation. All right, so that's not a problem. Now, the nice thing about this, if we think about it, there's two things. One is we didn't have to solve any differential equation to get this approximation equation. And the second one, which was kind of the problem in the assignment, is we didn't have to really deal with that discontinuity. We didn't have to separate the beam into two parts, anything like that. We were able to just solve it directly. All right, so if we look at the approximation, we're good to go. Now, one of the things that we mentioned was the thing of strong form versus weak form. If I were to solve that differential equation, I get something called the strong form solution. Now, when I solved it this way, I have something called the weak form solution. What exactly is that? That's something we're going to talk about a lot in finite element. And what it basically is, is this. A weak form solution is, again, it's a solution. Because if we look here, it approximated pretty well. However, the derivatives or the continuity of it as we decrease the terms, that's where it starts to get a little bit hazy. So if we look at our deflection, it's looking really good. This was the actual solution. But remember that we can also take the derivative to get moment. Well, then we can see that there is starting to be a little bit of a difference. Now, if we were to take the next derivative to get shear, we can see that this is where the approximation starts differ, uh, being uh, quite different than the exact solution. So this is what we mean by weak form, is once we start taking the derivatives of these solutions, the accuracy starts to decrease. So if we were to look at this, when we estimated the deflection, very good. Estimating moments, well, it's pretty good, still not too bad. But as we keep going down, once we get to shear, we can see that the approximation starts becoming less accurate. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But yeah, that's the Rayleigh or its method. What do you guys think? Questions, concerns, feeling pretty good? Hopefully feeling pretty good? All right, guys, welcome back. <laughs> so in the previous uh, little thing, we discussed the Rayleigh Ritz method, which was great, right? What do you guys think? Was the, the Rayleigh Ritz method easy, hard, difficult? What, what, what do you guys think? I, I, I'm curious. <laughs> he found it cute. Yeah, no, I agree. It's adorable. So I, I have a question. It's a direct message, so you guys didn't see it. 
but it says when we apply the boundary conditions to our approximation function, we actually get rid of some of the coefficients. In the case of the cantilever, we got rid of a0 and a1, and that's true. For a cantilever, we found that a0 and a1 are actually equal to 0. Now, what happens in the case of a fixed ends beam? What you guys will do is for a fixed ends beam, we of course have four essential boundary conditions. We have two for displacement, one at each end of the beam, and then we have two for rotation, one at each end of the beam. Now when we take it at one side, it's very easy to see that A0 and A1 go to zero because it's at X1 is equal to zero. But on the other side, we have the condition where Y approximate when X1 is equal to L is equal to zero. So what happens in that specific case is that you guys won't get A2 is equal to zero or something like that. What you do is you'll get a2 and a3 are going to be a function of the other functions. So what happens is you are able to solve for a2 and a3 in terms of the other components. It's kind of hard to kind of hard to explain, but let's let's put it this way. That's that's a, that's a really good question. That's great for the assignment. So let's see if I can pull up Mathematica. Which ones do I even have open? We can take we can take a peek together. So right now when I were to solve this, I got a1 and a2 are equal to 0. And let's delete this. Let's just keep the solution right here. This will be easy. So I got a a0 and a1 are equal to 0. So if I were to incorporate those other boundary conditions, all I would do is go, let's say, boundary condition 3, which is equal to my approximation when, at this specific one, we have displacement at x1 is equal to L. So I go x1 approaches L. All right, so that's going to be my third boundary condition. And my fourth one, so I'm going to say boundary condition 4, is the derivative of my approximation function with respect to x1 when x1 approaches L. So these are the other two. So this would account for the other end of the beam being fixed. Well, what I can do is I can add in two more equations. So I can go with BC3 equal to 0. I can go BC4 is equal to 0. And this just allows me to solve for two more coefficients. So what I do is if I have four uh, boundary conditions, I just go down the list. So I go A0, A1, A2, and A3. So from here, if I were to solve it, what I do is I get A0 is equal to 0, A1 is equal to 0, and then I get A2 as a function of A4, A5, and A6. I get a3 as a function of a4, a5, and a6. So once I get to this part up here with this potential energy, I already know what a2 and a3 are. So what I would do is I would just delete those two equations. Therefore, I have my three equations, three unknowns, stuff like that. So does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully. <laughs> That's a good question. Made your assignment that much easier. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And uh, Sabrina said straightforward. Great, 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 great. So the Rayleigh Ritz method, lots of fun, but we're going to go on to something a little bit different. Now, the Rayleigh Ritz method, I agree that it is cute. That was described perfectly because the Rayleigh Ritz method assumes a potential energy function. Remember, the whole thing was potential energy minimizing it. Now, that idea or that concept of potential energy, that only applies to conservative systems. Basically, in our words, linear, elastic isotropic systems, like that linear elastic crap. Now, when we're doing actual research in, say, concrete, steel, things aren't really conservative. We know that as we load something back and forth, let's say cyclically, we dissipate energy. It's not conservative anymore. So what we do is we go on to this method right here, the method of virtual work. Now, I don't know why my taskbar is actually showing up. That's kind of funny. Let's see if I can try again. No, no. I guess you guys get to see my taskbar at the bottom here. <laughs> now, the method of virtual work <clears throat> is good for any system, both conservative and non-conservative. So we take our Rayleigh-Ritz method, and now we're making a better method called the method of virtual work. Now, this method is really, really funny in that the virtual work idea, the virtual displacement, virtual strains, that was just an attempt to try and give it some physical meaning. This method in particular is derived basically from straight mathematics. That, that's why it's hard to visualize because you can't really visualize straight mathematics. They tried to make it a little bit easier by talking about virtual strains, virtual displacements. But in essence, this is just purely a nice mathematical proof 
but a very powerful mathematical proof. So let's let's get into the principle of virtual work. So again, just like before, we said that when we're dealing with those exact solutions, they're kind of a pain in the ass because we have those differential equations. We don't want differential equations. We want a way of approximating solutions. We went through the rayleigh ritz method. It was a lot of fun. Now, the virtual work method provides a way of approximating solutions without solving differential equations. And it's something that you guys have probably seen before. The principle of virtual work, it's very, very common. It has multiple applications, such as solving the reaction forces of determinants or indeterminate structures, finding displacements at specific points, or finding approximate displacement functions. Now, as you guys may have guessed, we're going to be focused on that last one there, finding approximate displacement functions. Now, you're going to say, well, in the Rayleigh-Ritz method, we minimize the potential energy of the system. What do we do in the virtual work method? Well, it's simple. We utilize something called the principle of virtual work. Now, when I see the principle of virtual work, I'm expecting something absolutely crazy, something completely bonkers. But if we look at the principle of virtual work, it's very simple. The internal virtual work of the system must be equal to the external virtual work of the system. Nice and simple. Well, at least it looks that way until you figure out what exactly these are. So the internal virtual work is defined as the integral of the real stresses multiplied by the virtual strains. All right, the virtual strains. Now, the external virtual work is the real forces multiplied by the virtual displacements. All right, so this can be the key here. We have real components and we have virtual components. This is why it's completely nuts trying to think about it in real life becomes a bit difficult because, again, this is purely mathematical. So let's get into the derivation for continuums. Remember that continuums are our most general case. Once you figure out continuums, then we can easily figure out beams or whatever thing you guys want to figure out. Now, the virtual work equations are actually kind of simple in that they can be decomposed into two steps. First one is we multiply our governing equations by a virtual displacement field, which for a continuum, I'm going to put u star. So anytime you guys see that little star, it basically means virtual, all right? So first one, we multiply by a virtual displacement field. And then the second one is we integrate over the domain. Seems easy. Let's see how easy it is. So let's look at our equilibrium equations for a continuum. So for a continuum, we have three equilibrium equations. If we were to look at the equilibrium equation in the E1 direction, it's simply the partial derivative of sigma 1, 1 with respect to x1, partial derivative of sigma 2, 1 with respect to x2, partial derivative of sigma 3, 1 with respect to x3, plus the body forces vector, which is equal to mass times acceleration. All right, so it's not too hard to see our equilibrium equations. And what we're going to do to make our life easier is we're going to assume a static case. So all these equilibriums are the sum of the forces in each direction must equal to zero. Makes sense. Most of our applications are static. We're going to be good to go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take these equilibrium equations and we're going to multiply them by a virtual displacement. So if we look at the bottom corner there, that's basically the total, the summation of the forces in the horizontal or the E1 direction multiplied by a displacement vector U1, our virtual displacement vector. Uh, the middle component, that's going to be the summation of the forces in the E2 direction multiplied by uh, a virtual displacement U2. And finally, we have the summation of the forces in the E3 direction multiplied by a virtual displacement. Now remember that since we said that this is a static case and the sum of the forces in each one of those directions must be equal to zero, we know that this equation as a whole must be equal to zero. All right, so this is what we're going to base everything off of. You guys good so far? If there's one proof that I'm going to lose you guys in in this course, it's probably going to be this one. But again, remember, I'm not too worried about these proofs. It's more about the applications. All right, so we're at this equation. We can take it a step further. We can simplify that equation into the following form, where instead of uh, partial sigma 2, 1 plus partial sigma 2, 2, etc., we can just have it as the summation a partial sigma ij with respect to xj multiplied by our virtual displacement ui star plus the summation of rho bi times ui star. And of course, this is all equal to zero. So this whole derivation is going to come from just playing around with this equation. We're going to, we're going to have some fun. So we said that after we multiply by a virtual displacement, which we did, we're good to go. Step one's in, in the books, good to go. We multiply, or sorry, we integrate over the domain. But before we do that, 
let's play around with this equation. You know, it's, it's fun to play around with the equations, you know, have a little bit of fun. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you guys this. So this equation here is not related to the equation above yet. If I were to take the partial derivative of sigma ji multiplied by ui star, so all is one, we know that we can use product rule to separate this into two terms. I take the derivative of one term, multiply by the other term, and then I add to the other term, multiply by the derivative of that second term. So I have partial uh, sigma ji with respect to xj multiplied by ui star plus sigma ji times the partial derivative of ui star. So again, that's just product rule separating these out. Now, right now, this means nothing. But what I can do is I can rearrange this equation into the following where partial sigma ji with respect to xj times ui star is equal to something. Now this is important because if I look at that term right there, well, that's actually a term above in our following equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equality and I'm going to substitute it into our governing equation to get the following. And then to make it easier, I'm going to take that term, the sigma ji multiplied by the partial derivative of ui star, and I'm just going to move it to the other side. So have I lost you guys yet? Uh, you guys good? <laughs> I'm going to check on, check up on you guys often throughout this proof to make sure that you guys are all happy. So far, so good? All right, I'll, I'll take the silence as a yes, doing good. All right, I hear good. Perfect. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation, and this is going to be the basis of our equation, and we're going to start playing around with it. Now, remember I always said that people are sneaky. When we go to textbooks, or if you guys go to conferences even, everything that's not mentioned is usually the stuff that's a little bit hairy. Now, what's usually hairy in this deri derivation, which you won't see a lot in textbooks, is what we do with this term right here. Usually they just say something like uh, tensor is symmetric, therefore we can play around with it, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is what we're going to do with it. This is the secret here, is we have sigma ji multiplied by the partial derivative of ui star. Now, up above here in the square, it says ij, but this is actually still ji at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we know that sigma ji is symmetric. One of the things we discussed a lot is that Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric. Therefore, I can take this component right here, and I can expand it out into the following, where sigma ji is equal to one half a sigma ij plus sigma ji. It's basically saying sigma ij plus sigma ij, which gives me two sigma ij, and then I divide it by two, I'm just left with sigma ij. So we're expanding it using the fact that it is symmetric. So what we're going to do is then we're going to take this partial ui star and we're going to substitute it or expand it into the equation to get the following over here. So I just took that partial ui star and I multiplied it into the brackets. Nothing too crazy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize the symmetry of sigma ij to create the following equation where I can uh, change the indices of the last one and then factor out that sigma ij. So I get sigma ij is equal to one half partial derivative of ui star plus the partial derivative of uj star. Now this is great because if we look at this component right here, this is our strain tensor. All right, so that is kind of the key thing. That's our strain tensor. Therefore, our equation simplifies into the following where that left-hand side stays the exact same. But on the right-hand side, we have the summation of sigma ij times epsilon star ij. So it's basically the real stresses multiplied by the virtual strains, which is exactly what we wanted when we're talking about internal virtual work. So now that we're done playing around with this equation, let's do step two, which is integrating over the domain. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the equation above, and I'm just going to add integral signs over the domain. Nice and easy, right? Well, it is because that's all you have to do. But of course, there's going to be more simplification once we add in those integral signs. So what we're going to look at specifically is we're going to look at simplifying this left-hand side. I'll give you guys a little bit of a spoiler alert right now. That second component and that third component, that's the final form. We don't need to manipulate those at all. It's only this first term that we need to manipulate, and then the derivation's actually done. So when we have partial sigma ji times ui star, this is actually referred to as the divergence of sigma ji times ui star. Now, what's nice about divergence is we have something called divergence theorem, which allows us to simplify this integral. So right now we are integrating over the domain. However, using divergence theorem, we can simplify the formula into sigma ji 
times ui star dotted with nj. Now, we're saying what is nj? Well, that's the normal vector. And you're saying, Clayton, normal vectors have to do with surfaces, not volumes. But if we look at this equation closely, our integral went from the volume, which is omega, to a surface on the volume, which is partial omega. Now, again, this looks confusing, but don't worry about it. We're more interested in the final equation, not the derivation. Now, another nice factor is if we look right here, we know that our stress tensor sigma, it's symmetric. Therefore, sigma u star dotted with n, well, that's the same as sigma dotted with n times u star. Therefore, I can just rearrange those two terms. I get the following equation. Now we're going to go, oh, wait a second, there's something familiar in there. Sigma dotted with n. Well, that's our traction vector. So what we can do is we can say that sigma ji dotted with nj, well, that is going to simply be our traction vector tn i, right? Nice and easy. So from there, we can look and we say, in this summation, I have a vector times a vector. Well, it's more or less the dot product once I do the summation. Therefore, we can simplify everything above into the following equation, where the virtual work for continuums is simply the integral over the surface of attraction vector tn dotted with u star plus the integral over the volume of rho b times u star, which is equal to the integral over the volume of the summation of sigma ij times uh, virtual strain epsilon ij. What do you guys think? <laughs> Not too bad? It's a, it's a difficult proof. You guys are doing pretty good though. Not too crazy. Now again, right, when we're, we're gonna apply this to beams. So continuums always look scary, but beams are much simpler. So I'm gonna ask you guys something real quick, just to test your guys' knowledge. We can see that we have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. There's an equal sign uh, between the second and third term there. Now the left-hand side, the left-hand side, is that the external virtual work or the internal virtual work? What do you guys think? I hear external. Any other brave souls out there? I see two externals. You guys are correct. So this is going to be the external virtual work. As we mentioned in the Rayleigh-Ritz method, the two external forces on a continuum are the traction vector, which we see we now have, our, have in our equation, and we have a body forces vector, which we also have in our equation. So this must mean that the other side here is the internal virtual work. So if we're solving for a continuum, we just go to these two equations, we create our equations, and we solve for our unknowns. It's actually nice and easy. However, it's a little bit complicated for continuum, so let's look at a nice, simpler case, beams. Now, again, we're going to use the same process that we did for the continuum to solve for our virtual work expression for a beam. Now, for an euler Bernoulli beam, we know that it's governed by the following differential equation, EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of the deflection function is going to be equal to our distributed load Q. Now, remember that we said for virtual work expressions, we do two things multiplied by a virtual displacement, and then integrate over the domain. All right, so the first one we're going to do is we're going to multiply each side by a virtual displacement y star. And then after that, we're going to integrate over the domain. Nice and easy. All I do is I take that differential equation. I multiply both sides by y star. So if we look there, both sides have a y star. And then we integrate over the domain. And for an euler Bernoulli beam, the domain is basically just the length of the beam. So we just integrate from 0 to L. Now, in this current form here, <coughs> it's actually a little bit tricky. So what we need to do is we need to simplify it. So what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate this equation through integration by parts, specifically twice. So my first integration by parts is I'm going to take that left-hand side equation, do my integration by parts, and I get the following. All right, so it doesn't really matter what you guys look at right now, as long as you guys realize the final answer. So from here, we're going to say, all right, this doesn't look too bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do integration by parts again, but this time I'm going to do it on that term right there that we obtained in round one, and we get the following right here, which looks pretty ugly. Why does it look ugly? Well, I took that nice equation that we had after we integrated, and now we're left with this which looks absolutely disgusting. Like you say, Clayton, you're trying to simplify things, but you just made it look gross. I have accomplished nothing. But we actually accomplished something very, very special. Because if we look here, there's actually a lot of simplification we can do. If we look at the first term there, EI multiplied by the second derivative of the deflection function, well, we know that's our shear force function. If we look at EI multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function, 
we know that that's the moment function. And finally, if we have dy with respect to dx, well, we know that that is simply the rotation function. So even though this equation looks really gross, it can be simplified into the following. All right. And what we can do is we can actually simplify it one step further, where the virtual work expression is simply the integral from 0 to L of EI multiplied by the second derivative of our deflection function, multiplied by the second derivative of our virtual deflection function, which is equal to all those external terms. Now, if you guys were to look at the actual proof for Euler Bernoulli beams, you would end up with this one right here. But this one right here, it's not too nice. Like, look at it. It has shear terms. When I solved for a beam in the Rayleigh-Ritz method, I didn't need shear. Why would I need shear here? Well, we're going to see that we actually don't use this equation. We use a more simplified equation. So just like before, on the left-hand side, we have our internal virtual work. And then on the right-hand side, we have our external virtual work. And we're going to really look at this right-hand side because right now, it's actually quite confusing what that equation actually means. It looks quite complicated. So let's just take a quick look at what this equation actually means. So right now, we're left with this which basically means that if we have a beam here subjected to a load, we see that we have basically four terms. We have a V1, a V2, which are a shear, and we have an M1 and an M2, which is kind of confusing. What these actually are, are the shear and the moment at the left-hand side of the beam, and the shear and the moment at the right-hand side of the beam. All right, so if we look at this, this looks gross because you're thinking, well, if I want to solve for the external virtual work, I need to know the shear at both ends of the beams. Well, that's not really fun. On top of that, I have a virtual displacement function y star everywhere. So what I do is I assume a virtual displacement function y star, and this virtual function is actually what is present in the equation twice. Once in the internal virtual work term, and the second one in the external virtual work term. Now, what we do is we say that the, the virtual displacement function at x1 is equal to a, or on this side, we have y1 star that appears twice, and then the displacement virtual displacement function at the other end, that appears twice. Now, this looks really, really gross, and I keep emphasizing that because, again, this is not the equation that we're going to deal with, because if we look at this right here, it doesn't have anything considering point loads or concentrated moments, anything like that. So let's just take an example. This is the best way to show you guys. Let's say that we have the following beam over here, distributed load, subjected to a point load, uh, fixed at one end, pinned at the other. What we would do is we take the external virtual work of that first segment, so between points one and two, and we have our gross equation, but there is some simplification. If we look at one, we can see that the beam is fixed there. Therefore, it's going to have no deflection. Therefore, y1 star is going to be equal to zero. We also see that, well, if it's fixed, the rotation must also be zero. Therefore, theta one star is equal to zero. Now, if we were to look at the second half of the beam, it's also pretty gross. We see that it is pinned at point three. Now, a pin means that there's no deflection. Therefore, y three star is equal to zero. And we have no moment because of a pin. Therefore, the m three is actually going to be equal to zero right now, too. Now, if we were to look at our distributed load, our distributed load doesn't change over this domain. So the integral from 0 to L of Q times Y star and the integral from L1 to L2 of Q times Y star, well, those can actually be combined into one integral. So if I were to look at the summation of the external virtual work, I get the following equation. So I just took uh, external virtual work of L1 and added to the external virtual work of L2. So I can see that my integral just became from 0 to L2 rather than two integrals. And then basically what I left with in the shear terms is I get V2 uh, at L2 minus V2 of L1 times Y2 star plus M2 of L1 minus M2 of L2. Now what this basically means right here is this is how does the shear change at a point? All right, how does the shear change at a specific point. Now, I'm going to ask you guys in the chat. There's only one scenario where at a very at a tiny point there is a change in shear. When does that happen? When does it happen that we have a jump in shear at a specific point? What do you guys think? Concentrated load. You guys are exactly correct. So this term right here, well this is actually just our point load P. Nice and easy. This one right here, the second term with the moments, that is the change in moments 
at a point. So for this particular beam, what is M2L1 minus M2L2? The change in moment at a point. What do you guys think that term is right there? Zero. You guys are absolutely correct. That is the change in moment at a point, and that only occurs if we have a concentrated moment, which we don't. So therefore, that's actually going to be zero. So for a discontinuous beam, if we were to look at the internal virtual work, it's going to be the same conclusions that we kind of covered in the external virtual work. If we were to sum the internal virtual work of L1 and L2, well, we're basically just taking two integrals of the exact same function. Therefore, the internal virtual work can just be summed over the whole length of the beam. Therefore, if I were to uh, equate the internal virtual work to the external virtual work in this case, we can see we have the following nice equation, where the internal virtual work can be taken as just a single integral over the whole length of the beam, and the external virtual work can be calculated solely from those external loads. We didn't actually need to go into the shear or anything like that. Therefore, the simplified virtual work expression is as follows, where the internal virtual work is the integral from 0 to L of EI multiplied by the second derivative of the deflection function multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function. And this is equal to basically the exact same formula we had for the Rayleigh-Ritz method for external work. The only difference is in the Rayleigh-Ritz method, we multiplied by our approximation function. In the, ex, uh, the virtual work method, we multiply by our virtual function. So for instance, if we were looking at the distributed load Q, we multiply that by Y star, which is our virtual deflection. All right. So it doesn't look too bad. So virtual work method, it's kind of confusing, just like the Rayleigh-Ritz method of, at the start, but we have some general steps. So the first one is we're going to assume a displacement polynomial or displacement function. So again, let's just say our approximate solution is a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. And just like before, our goal is to solve for a naught, a1, and a2. Now, also just like before, we have to ensure that this function satisfies our essential boundary conditions. Therefore, let's say if it's pinned at x1 is equal to 0, well, then a0 is going to be equal to 0. Again, just like the Rayleigh-Ritz method. Now, it's going to start changing at this point right here. Because once we updated our approximation function, well, we're going to create our virtual function. So remember that in that internal virtual work term, we had two different y's. We had our approximate y, and we had our virtual y. How do we get that virtual y? Well, it's simple. After we have updated our approximate y to account for the essential boundary conditions, our virtual y is going to be the exact same function, but instead of a1, a2, a3, etc., we're going to have a1 star, a2 star, a3 star, etc. For example, if I were to say that my approximation function was a1, x1, plus a2 x1 squared, well then my virtual deflection function is going to be a1 star times x1 plus a2 star times x1 squared. Does that make sense? Hopefully. This is usually the most confusing part, confu confusing part is picking this virtual displacement function. But it's actually very simple. We just set it equal to our approximation function. We just replace the coefficients with virtual coefficients. Now that we have both our approximate y as well as our virtual y, we can calculate that internal virtual work. And it's simply the integral over the length of the beam of ei multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function multiplied by the second derivative of our virtual uh, displacement function. And we look here, ei, that's something that's given. y approximate and y star, well, we just have those above. Therefore, we technically have no unknowns once we're solving this equation. So from there, we can calculate the external virtual work. We had a nice formula for that. And again, it's nice and simple. It's just based on those exterior loads. So we don't really have any unknowns there. Now, the key here to the, the virtual work method, which confuses a lot of people, is this. We equate, we equate the internal virtual work and the external virtual work. Again, that's called the principle of virtual work. Therefore, we have IVW is equal to EVW. Now, we have one equation for however many unknowns. In this particular case, if I had a1 and a2, that's two unknowns, but I only have one equation. So this is where it starts scaring a lot of people, where we have one equation, but we have x number of unknowns, depending on how many a coefficients we've picked. 
So what we need to do is once we equate these two, the internal virtual work and the external virtual work, we arrange the equation so that the virtual coefficients are actually factored out. What do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to take my external virtual work and my internal virtual work, factor out those virtual coefficients to give me something like this, where something, something, something times a1 star plus something, something, something times a2 star is going to be equal to something, something, something times a1 star plus something, something, something times a2 star. Why do we do this? Well, the coefficient in front of a1 star on the left-hand side must be equal to the coefficient of a1 star on the right-hand side. So how do we create the equations we need to solve the system? Well, we create the we equate the coefficients in front of those virtual displacement uh, coefficients. Therefore, if I were to look at this equation above, I can say, well, I have a1 star on one side, I have a2 star on the other side. Therefore, those two coefficients in front must be equal to each other. That'll be my equation one. Similarly, I have a2 star on one side and a2 star on the other side. Well, those coefficients must be the exact same. Therefore, I have my second equation. Now, if we were to look at these equations, virtual coefficients cancel each other out. a1 star on one side, a1 star on the other side, just cancel each other out. We're good to go. Therefore, at this point, we can solve for a1 and a2. So virtual work method looks really tricky because we seemingly have one equation, but with that one equation, we can create X number of equations to solve for X number of a coefficients. Does that make sense to you guys? Hopefully, thumbs up. We're gonna do an example right here now. So if it doesn't make sense, we'll show you guys how to do it in Mathematica and we'll be good to go. So what I'll do is uh, just bring this down, virtual work method, Pop this up uh, right here. So we're going to do the same example now, except we're going to do it with the virtual work method. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in the parameters. Uh, first of all, we have the length is equal to 6. We have D is equal to 4. We've already covered this, so you guys know exactly what's going on here. We have Q is equal to negative 45. P is equal to negative 100. E we said is 20,000 kPa. Perfect. And finally, we have our moment of inertia as simply, oops, <laughs> not that. Perfect. So I'm going to define EI as simply EM multiplied by IG. All right. So all I did right now was input our parameters and we are good to go. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit so you guys can see the virtual work method equations. And I'm going to ask you guys again, because we're going to do this together as one big happy family. What is our first step in our virtual work method? Perfect, our approximate solution. Approximate function. So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna say y approx is equal to, and what do you guys want it equal to? Fourth order, fifth order, sixth order? What do, what are you guys feeling? What, what makes you guys happy? Sixth order? All right, I guess we're going sixth order again. All right. A0 plus A1 times X1 plus A2 times X1 squared. What I'm going to do just to save some time, I'm just going to copy this. All right, let's see how many that is. So I'll just replace A3, X1, 3, go to the other side, A4, 5, A6. Perfect. All right, so if we were to run it, we now have our approximation function. And just like before, we now know none of the A coefficients. So what were, what were we trying to do? Well, we're trying to solve for those A coefficients. What's the first step in solving for those A coefficients? Satisfy boundary conditions. You guys are exactly correct. So I'm going to go essential boundary conditions. Now, our first boundary condition we know is that x1 is equal to 0. So I'm going to say boundary condition 1. Well, this is going to be our approximate solution, specifically when x1 is equal to 0. Now, our second boundary condition, boundary condition 2, has to deal with rotation. So this is going to be the derivative, so d, the derivative of our approximation function with respect to x1, specifically when x1 approaches zero. Now to solve it, I'm just going to go solve is equal to solve 
And from here, I'm going to say I have two equations. We know that boundary condition 1 must equal 0 because there's no displacement. And we know boundary condition 2 must equal 0 because there's no rotation. Therefore, we can solve for two of the coefficients. So I'm going to solve for a0 as well as a1. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to store them as variables after. So a0, uh, a1 is equal to a0, a1 when solution 1. So from here, we can see that a0 and a1, well, they're both equal to 0. We can look up at our approximation function. We see that a0 and a1 are now black, meaning they are defined, which is good. We want all of those a coefficients to be black by the end. Now, if we look here, a2, a3, a4, a5, a6, still not defined. Therefore, we need to solve for them. So what are we going to do next? The first two steps are easy because that's the same as the Rayleigh-Ritz method. But what is our next step in the virtual work method? Remember for the virtual work method, virtual work computation. <laughs> uh, yes, technically. So if we look at our virtual work method, remember, we're taking this internal virtual work and we're equating it to our external virtual work. Now, if we were to look at these two equations, they both have y star in them. Do we have y star defined? We don't. So Bryce is right where we set the virtual displacement function as y approximate. Exactly. So what we need to do is we need to define our virtual, and I'll actually scroll down here so it's not so far down, displacement function. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call it y star. So we have y approximate and y star. Now remember, they are equal to each other. So I'm going to say y star is equal to y approximate, but we need to replace those coefficients. So remember in y approximate, we have a1, a2, a3, etc. We need to replace those with virtual coefficients. So I'm going to say that the two equations are equal, but I'm going to take a2 and I'm going to replace it with a2 uh, s, a2 star. And I need to do that with all of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this because we have a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6. So we need uh, five of them. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, and we just go through and replace. So the first one we have a2, well, we want a3 to a3 star. We want a4 to a4 star, a5 to a5 star, and finally a6 to a6 star. Now, if I were to run this, we can see that my y, actually, I'll run it with uh, my approximate 2, just to show you guys the how they are the exact same. So my approximate solution is a2 times x1 squared. My virtual is a2 star times x1 squared. If I were to look up here, my approximate a3 times x1 cubed. My virtual is a3 star times x1 cubed. So they are the exact same. The only thing I did is I replaced the a coefficients with virtual a coefficients, but that, that's it. So what I'm going to do is I'll suppress this. I'll delete this one right here and we are good to go. So after we have that virtual displacement function, we said that we can calculate both the internal virtual work and the external virtual work. So which one do you guys want to calculate first? What, what are you guys feeling? You guys feeling more internal? You guys feeling external? Completely up to you guys. All right, Bryce says internal virtual work for being so brave. We will do the internal, actually I'll comment in so you guys know what I'm doing. Internal virtual work. And I just call it IVW. Now all we need to do is follow this exact formula. So it's actually a piece of cake once you guys have defined this. So we know that we're taking integrals. So integrate, if I can spell of course. <laughs> integrate, again, it takes in two arguments. The second one is the domain. So we're going to have integral from x1 is 0 all the way to L. And then in here, all we need to do is substitute our function, which is really simple. So we know it's EI multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function. So I'm, I'm going to go D for derivative. We know that we're doing our approximation function. And then we're taking it with respect to x1, and we're doing the derivative twice. So again, I'm taking the derivative of our approximation function with respect to x1, and I'm doing it twice since it's the second derivative. From there, I have to multiply this by the exact same thing, but instead of our approximate solution, uh, we're doing it by our virtual. So I'm going to take the derivative of y star with respect to x1, and again, I'm doing that twice. So if I were to run this right here, as we can see, it's an absolute mess in this current case. So again, it's just to show you guys, if you guys want to do it by hand, good luck. <laughs> 
I, I wish I wish you the best. It's uh, not going to be too nice, though, if I'm being honest. So now that we have the internal virtual work, of course, we can move on to the external virtual work. And it's also very, very simple. We just follow our nice formula. We go through. Do we have a distributed load? Well, yes, we do. So our first one, which I'll call e external virtual work one, which has to do with the, ex uh, the distributed load. This is going to be the integral. So integrate. <laughs> And all we need to do is take our distributed load and then multiply it by our virtual displacement y star. So Q times y star. And we're integrating this over x1 from 0 to L. So that's going to be our first external virtual work term. Again, it looks absolutely disgusting. So I'm going to suppress it. We have a second external virtual work term because we have that point load there. But the point load is simple. It's just going to be our point load times the virtual displacement at that point. So we're going to have P times Y star, specifically when X1 approaches D. So it's basically saying that it's P times our displacement when our, our displacement at this point of load application. We have to remember this last part right here. If you guys don't do that, everything else, <laughs> it might go a little bit wrong. And again, it looks very, very gross. So what I'm going to do is external virtual work, the total external virtual work, it's going to be equal to the first term plus the second term. So if I do that, it looks something like this. So how are you guys feeling so far? Pretty good? I got to check up on you guys. I'll take it that you guys are doing pretty, pretty good. So now what do we do? We calculate our internal virtual work, calculate our external virtual work. What exactly do we do? OK, so I heard that we equate them. So if I were to go, equating is the principle of virtual work. So you guys want me to say in general virtual work, something like that? What's happen if we run this? Doesn't really do anything. It actually, it, it would store internal virtual work as our external virtual work. So one of the uh, one of the suggestions is uh, try the solve equation. So if we were to solve, we have our external virtual work is equal to our internal virtual work. I guess for the solve equation, it's the double. And we're trying to solve for what? All of our A coefficients. So we have a2, a3, a4, a5, a6. What happens if I run this? We have a problem. Because we're inputting one equation, but trying to solve for six coefficients. As well as our current equations have both the A coefficients as well as our virtual coefficients. Remember that when we're solving these equations, we need to have them just a function of our actual coefficients, not our virtual coefficients. So where's the PowerPoint? So remember that what we said is we take the coefficient in front of the virtual displacement, or we take the coefficient in front of the virtual coefficient, and we make it equal to the coefficient in front of the virtual coefficient on the other side, right? So what I'm going to do is if this is the internal virtual work, I'm going to take this coefficient and I'm going to minus it from the internal virtual, uh, no, sorry. And then I'm going to subtract this coefficient over here and it must equal zero. Actually, we'll just, we'll just keep it actually a simpler way. So what we're going to do, uh, how should I do this? There's, there's many ways you guys can do this. Let's put it this way. Let me just type in the Mathematica code and see what you guys think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this because again, we want to create equations. So I'm going to put equation one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a function called coefficient. Now what this will do is this will take the coefficient in front of a term. This is exactly what we want, because we want a coefficient in front of those virtual terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the coefficient of the internal virtual work function, and I'm going to take the coefficient in front of the a to star. All right, so if I run this, this gives me the coefficient in front of the a to star, uh, coefficient in the internal virtual work uh, equation. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract this from the A coefficient in the external virtual work. So if I were to do that, 
Now I have an equation for A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. Does this make sense to you guys? I'm taking the coefficient in front of A2 star in the internal virtual work, and I'm basically equating it to the coefficient in front of A2 star of the external virtual work. Does that make sense to you guys? This is the hardest part is trying to figure out how to program it. What do you guys think? It's pretty quiet. Pretty quiet in the chat. If I go back to the PowerPoint, again, all I did was I took this value right here and I made it and I subtracted it from this value right here. If I move this to the other side, it's basically saying that this, subtract this, is going to be equal to zero. I hear a fine. <laughs> not, not as enthusiastic as I'd like, but all right, I, I got a fine and I'll take it. I'll take it. So all we're going to do is we're going to take the coefficients in front of each one of the virtual terms. So we have a two star, a three star, a four star, a five star, and a six star. So I'm just going to come down, create a bunch of equations. I'll say my equation two. It's going to be the same thing, except instead of a two star, we're doing a three star. Why you don't coefficient of external virtual work minus internal virtual work. You can do whatever you want in Mathematica. This is one of those things where I just do this to uh, try and keep it general so you guys can try and follow along. That's the beauty about computer programming is you guys don't even have to do this multiple times. You guys can make a loop. You guys can do whatever you want. This is more just for the purposes of illustration. Completely up to you guys. Oops. Equation 4. A 5 star. And then I guess I need one more. So we'll have an equation 5 down here. So we'll go over here. A6. Oh, I suppressed them all. But basically what happens is we just created five equations. Now that we've created five equations, we can solve for our five unknowns. So what I'm going to go is I'm going to go down here. We're going to use our solve function. Now we're going to input our five equations. So we know equation 1. It's going to be equal to 0. Equation 2, equal to 0. Equation 3, equal to 0. 4 is equal to 0. And 5 is equal to 0. Now that we've given it 5 equations, it allows us to solve for 5 unknowns. So in our second argument, we're going to input our unknowns that we want. Well, we want a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6. So if I were to solve them, it now gives us our nice coefficients for a. So I can suppress this. And I'm just going to store them. So I'm going to go a2, a3, a4, a5, a6 is going to be equal to a2, a3, a4, a5, a6 when solution 1 of 1. So now that they're all stored, I can put in my approximate equation. And I have my displacement equation. And that's it. So the only tricky part about the virtual work method is realizing this coefficients thing. Once you guys have that, you guys are good to go. And that's it. So hopefully that was nice and easy for you guys. Uh, is there any questions about the virtual work method? Actually, I have just one yes. question. Um, you, you didn't use it in this example, but you have theta star. Yes. Or, I mean, is, even just theta in general, is that... Um, is that the derivative of y? Exactly. Or no? That is the derivative okay. of y. So if I had a concentrated moment, all I would do is take the derivative of my virtual displacement function. That would be my theta star function. Sounds good. Perfect. No, that's, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Any other questions? No. So this method cannot capture the drop in shear. So... What I'll do is I'll just exit out. I got Mathematica open absolutely everywhere. So what we'll do is we'll go to E-Class, and I'll show you guys, because in E-Class, I actually uh, plot them out. So under Virtual Work Method, I show you guys also uh, an example by hand, just in case you guys are confused about the process. I, I always find that a written example always helps, so you guys can check that out if you guys want. But if I were to open up the... I'll just save it wherever. All right. So if we look right here, it does not capture the drop in shear. And again, the reason why is because we're assuming, uh, where is my function? We're assuming one continuous function 
over the whole domain. All right, so the only way that we're able to capture a big drop in shear like that or a discontinuous drop in shear is if we use a discontinuous function where it's equal to something in one domain and equal to something in the next domain. Now, again, as you guys will see, if we add a bunch of terms, let's say that we add uh, terms all the way up until 810, right? What will happen is this approximation will get better and better. So it might follow the blue line here. And as we'll see, it'll curve down right here and then kind of curve and follow it again. So it'll get better. But again, you're adding a lot of computation time. Like this is where the where we start talking about the finite element method. We can add. It's very easy to add more terms, but then the computation time is going to increase. So the question is, is when do we stop adding terms and say, you know what, this approximation is is good enough? That's one of the main things of the finite element method. So I hope that answers your question. It cannot uh, capture the drop in shear. It can start to approximate it really well if we keep adding terms, but uh, other than that, not so much. Like. Uh, let's try something fun. So we'll take, uh, I'll, let's try something fun. Let's get rid of, uh, how many terms? Let's get rid of two terms. So I'm getting rid of a five and so I'm just deleting some terms. That'll stay the same. Uh, I'm decreasing the accuracy. It's, it's easier to decrease the accuracy than to increase it right now. So I'm taking away these two equations. Let's see what happens. That should be good. Should be. So as we can see, the accuracy changes quite a bit by how we add those terms. Look at the moment. As we can see, the approximation for the deflection is still really good. But then the moment, it gets a little bit more shaky. And when we go down to the shear, it gets a lot more shaky. So we keep adding terms. The approximations of the derivatives will start getting better as well. Hopefully that helped answer your question. All right, so uh, before we take our last little break, I want to show you guys this week's assignment. So this week's assignment should be nice and easy if you guys understood everything we just talked about. Uh, basically, we just have one beam. It's just one question assignment. And with this beam, we want to do a couple things. First is determine the exact displacement solution. That's the differential equation. You guys did that in assignment one. That shouldn't be a problem. The second is use the Rayleigh-Ritz method to obtain approximate displacement solutions for polynomials of the zeroth, second, fourth, and sixth order. All right, so the Rayleigh-Ritz method, we've already done that. I gave you guys code. You guys can use the code to find your approximations. Part C, uh, find the approximate displacement solution using the virtual work method with a fourth order differential or a fourth order polynomial. So again, we just did that too. That should be a piece of cake. And finally, D and E, it's just compare. So all we really want in this assignment is the exact displacement solution of the beam. You guys know how to do that. Uh, the approximate displacement using the Rayleigh-Ritz method. You guys are now experts at that. And finally, the approximate displacement solution using the virtual work method. And you guys are now experts at that. So the assignment this week, I'm hoping should be nice and easy. What, what do you guys think? Is there any questions? Do you guys feel adequate to uh, tackle this assignment? Must have been pretty easy. <laughs> fine, fine. <laughs> All right. Well, this is assignment two. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. Again, I want these to be nice, uh, straightforward assignments. You guys, we covered examples of everything that you guys need for this assignment, so should be good to go. So that's that's it for assignment two, and that's it for the virtual work method. Uh, we'll take another break, and when we come back, we'll move on to uh, more methods. But don't worry, these ones are a little bit different. <laughs> so you guys will be doing just fine. So we'll take a 10-minute break. I'll see you guys back at, uh, well, let's say nine-minute break. We'll see you guys back at 10.15. I'll stick around for a little bit if you guys have any questions as well. All right, guys, welcome back to the last little half of this lecture. Again, we're going to discuss two other methods. Uh, they're fairly simple. And by simple, I mean that once you know the virtual work method and the Rayleigh-Ritz method, the other methods are also very similar to comprehend. But before we do that, there is an outstanding lack of silence <laughs> when it came to the virtual work method. So I just want to really show you guys what I mean by those coefficients, because it really is a little bit tricky to understand. So covering the exact same example as we did in Mathematica, except in this time, 
because I'm doing it by hand, I kept it nice and easy as a, a second order uh, polynomial function. Uh, what I want to show you guys is exactly what happens, what I mean by those coefficients are equal to each other. Now, you guys may understand this completely and you say, Clayton, just shut up and move on. But <laughs> again, there's silence in the chat. And usually I, I teach 132, which is uh, statics for first years. Usually silence means a very bad thing. So uh, uh, I know that you guys are graduate students. You guys are super smart and you guys I, I guarantee that you guys understand this and I'm just worrying too much, but uh, I just want to really make sure you guys see what's happening. So when we equate the external, and I'll even zoom in a little bit more, when we equate the external virtual work and the external virtual work, we have the internal virtual work here and we have the external virtual work here. Now notice that every single term contains an A2 star, so A2 star, A2 star, A2 star. So what we can do is we factor out these A2 stars. So I get 4EI times A2 times L times A2 star is equal to QL, Q times L cubed divided by 3 plus P times D squared times A2 star. Now if we look at this equation, the A2 stars cancel out. Therefore, I'm left with this equation right here with no virtual A2 star. We just have our real coefficient A2. Therefore, I can solve for what A2 is. So it's really hard to see by the theory, and it's hard to see in Mathematica because, of course, when you look at computer code, it, it's not exactly transparent of what it's uh, implicating, which is why I did these examples by hand for a simpler case so you guys can see exactly uh, the methodology that we are doing. So hopefully it, uh, it makes sense to you guys. Again, you guys probably know. You guys are probably just laughing at me saying, Clayton, we already know. Just move on. But uh, I want to make sure. The, the goal of this course is to increase your understanding, so I'm, I'm trying my best. All right, so uh, at this point, we covered the rayleigh ritz method, and we covered the virtual work method, which, of course, is your guys' assignment. So everything that you guys need for your assignments this week, it's been covered in detail. So now we're going to discuss some extra methods. Uh, the first one here, this point collocation method, we don't really use it uh, that often, but the second method we discuss, uh, we use it a lot. Now, the good news is that second method that we discuss it's actually essentially the virtual work method. So there's nothing too much to worry about. So we're going to start with the point collocation method. And to me, this is the trolley method. This is the, the funny method. When we looked at Rayleigh Ritz method, we, we were pretty, uh, I don't know how to say it. Like we sounded pretty smart. You know, we're minimizing the potential energy of the system. Like we sound like we know what the hell we're doing. For the virtual work method, same thing where we're saying this internal virtual work is equal to the external virtual work it's the principle of it virtual displacements virtual strains like you sound pretty smart the point collocation method is <laughs> is the trolley method in that it's basically just substitute points what do you mean by that well i'm going to show you guys so the point collocation method is an approximation method in which we select an approximation function and we ensure that this approximation function satisfies the boundary conditions, which is one of the uh, requirements to be considered kinematically admissible, and satisfies the governing equation at specific points called collocation points. So in essence, all this method does is we take our approximate solution, we make sure that it satisfies the boundary conditions, and then we just make sure that it satisfies a couple points. And that's it. <laughs> that's why I call it the trolley method. It's just nice and simple. Nice and easy. So to show you guys this method, and, and that's it for the theory. That, like, that's it. So to show you guys what exactly this method does, let's look at a uniaxial uh, loading scenario of a bar. So this bar can only stretch in the horizontal direction. We're not considering any other degrees of freedom. Now, this uh, particular scenario is governed by the following differential equation. Uh, Ea multiplied by the second derivative of our displacement function is equal to negative p, where negative p is our distributed load across the beam. And we said that p is equal to c times x1. So what we're going to do, just like before, is we're going to assume an approximation function. In this case, I picked a third order. So we got a0 plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared plus a3 times x1 cubed. And all we're going to do is solve for these a coefficients by two different things. One is we're going to satisfy the boundary conditions. So of course, at each end of the beam, we have a boundary condition. And two, we're going to satisfy those collocation points. Now, how many points that we satisfy is dependent on the number of A coefficients. If I have, let's say, five A coefficients, 
left, I need to have five points because every time I solve for a point, I get one of those coefficients. And you guys are going to see what exactly I mean. Now, the question becomes, what do you mean by satisfying these points? Well, I'm going to make sure that at this point, so if that green dot at the center of my beam there was a collocation point, I'm going to make sure that that point satisfies this equation exactly. And that's exactly what we're going to do. It's, it's nice and easy. Again, very trolly. So if we look here, we have our beam. We said that our approximate solution is simply a third order polynomial. And what we're going to do for simplicity is we're just going to take the derivative of this polynomial. So we have a1 plus 2 times a2x1 plus 3 times a3x1 squared. Now, if we look here, we have two boundary conditions, one at the left side of the beam, one at the right side of the beam. The first one at the left side of the beam, very simple. We know it's fixed. Therefore, the displacement at x1 is equal to 0 is going to be 0. Therefore, our approximate solution at 0 is going to be equal to 0. And we can conclude that a0 is equal to 0. Right? Nice and easy. Uh, question for you guys now. What is the boundary condition at the right side of the beam? There is no essential boundary condition, but for this method, we're just satisfying boundary conditions. So Mahmoud says strain, and that's correct. So even though it doesn't look like it, there is a strain boundary condition, but we don't usually start with strain. What we do is we say that the stress at x1 is equal to L is zero because it's a free end. Any free surface, we know that there's no stress. But as Mahmoud said, it's actually going to be related to strain because we know that in a uniaxial case, our strain, which is equal to sigma divided by the Young's modulus, is equal to the derivative of our displacement function with respect to x1. Therefore, we actually have a second boundary condition, du over dx1 at L is going to be equal to 0. And that's why I took the derivative above is because that will actually be an equation we use to satisfy a boundary condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equation above, substitute a value of L into there, and make it equal to 0. And I get A1 is equal to negative 2 times A2L plus 3 times A3L squared. So therefore, I can update my approximation equation into the following. And if I look at this, I have two coefficients left. So I have A2 as well as A3. So the boundary conditions are now satisfied. The next step that we need to do is solve for those coefficients using those collocation points. So let's start off with our first point. We know that our new approximation solution has the following form. And if I were to take the second derivative of it, I get 2a2 plus 3a3 times x1. Now it should be 6a3, so there is a little bit of a <laughs> little bit of a typo there, but just disregard that for now. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to say that we have a collocation point at x1 is equal to L over 2. So I'm basically just placing a point right in the center of our beam there. Now, what I mean by satisfying this is I mean that that point right there has to satisfy this differential equation. So therefore, all, we, all we're going to do is substitute our approximation solution into there and then solve for a coefficient. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take that EA and I'm going to move it over to the right hand side. Therefore, I get the following uh, displacement function. Therefore, all, all the collocation points have to satisfy this, where uh, if I substitute a value of x1, it must be equal. Now, it's kind of confusing, but uh, this is where we're going to basically <laughs> go off of. So if we're doing a collocation point at x1 is equal to L over 2, I'm just going to sub x1 is equal to L over 2 into that equation, and I get 2a2 plus 6a3 times L over 2. So again, I'm just going to move my mouse onto the screen here. That's this second derivative right here. Again, the 3 is wrong. It should be 6. And all I did was substitute L over 2 into x1. And we know that this is going to be equal to negative c times x1. So negative c. But we know x1 is equal to L over 2 divided by ea. So now I have my ea in there. Now, if I were to look at this equation, I have an equation. So therefore, I can solve for what a2 is equal to. I get a2 is equal to negative cl over 4ea plus 3a3l divided by 2. From there, I can update my approximation equation. And now instead of having a2 and a3 as unknowns, all I have left now is a3. How do I solve for a3? Well, I just add another one of those collocation points. So I'm going to have my updated solution my updated second derivative, and then I'm going to input a new point. So at this time, let's look at the point x1 is equal to L. Now again, all I'm doing is I'm satisfying our differential equation for that very specific point. Therefore, 
If I were to substitute values in, I get negative 2 of CL divided by 4EA plus 3A3L divided by 2 <laughs> plus 6A3 times L is equal to negative CL divided by EA. Our only unknown in here is going to be A3. Therefore, I can solve for what A3 is equal to. And if I were to substitute all my variables in, so A0, A1, A2, and A3 into our equation, we get our final approximation as CL squared divided by 2EA times x1 minus c divided by 6ea times x1 cubed. All right, so this is kind of the solution. We solve for those unknown a coefficients by simply satisfying our differential equation at specific points along the beam. Nice and easy. Now, if we were to compare this approximate solution to the exact solution. So if I were to solve that differential equation in Mathematica or any program or even by hand, uh, maybe not be that smart, but uh, if I were to solve the differential equation to obtain the exact solution, I would actually get the exact same thing as here. All right, so in this particular case, my approximate solution is equal to my exact solution. Now, what do you guys think? Is, is that normal? Is that not normal? Is something wrong? What do you guys think? Is it normal? Is this, uh, let's put it this way, is this normal to have this or is this more or less the exception? Yes, it, it, it is the exact solution. So in this particular case, the approximate is equal to the exact solution. So it's the exception. As Ackman said, it depends on the problem. Now, the only reason why our approximate solution in this case was equal to our exact solution is two things. One is the exact solution was a polynomial. If our exact solution was not a polynomial, then we would never be able to get the exact solution since our approximation is a polynomial. The second thing is, is that we included enough terms to cover the order of the exact solution. In this particular case, the exact solution is a third order polynomial, and we assumed a third order polynomial. Now, if we assumed a second order polynomial, we wouldn't be able to get the exact solution, stuff like that. So uh, the only thing to keep in mind, this is more the exception than the norm. And the only reason why we were able to capture it is because we had enough terms and the exact solution was a polynomial. So we can uh, mimic it with a polynomial. So that right there is the collocation method again. Nice and easy. Just satisfy the boundary or sorry, the governing equation at specific points. Nice and easy. Now, the second one we're going to get into is called the weighted residuals method. And now I put in brackets the Galerkin method. Now, the weighted residuals method is not the Galerkin method. The Galerkin method is a variation of the weighted residuals method. But the only reason why I put Galerkin in there is because when you guys ever look at a finite element book or if, when you guys look at Abacus, the Galerkin method is what we're actually going to be uh, using to solve our differential equations. All right, so this Galerkin method, it's going to be very important to us, as you guys will see in the next lecture. So the next lecture, we actually get into the finite element formulations. And when we get into the finite element formulations, we rely upon this Galerkin method. Now, there's a little bit of a spoiler. This Galerkin method is essentially the virtual work method. You're going to get the exact same answer if you use Galerkin or virtual work. So they're essentially the same. However, when we're dealing with finite element formulations, we deal with something called shape functions. And it's much easier expressed using the Galerkin method. It just makes more sense uh, using the Galerkin method. And by sense, I mean it, it's, uh, it's clear to see what exactly is going on in this method. So we're going to discuss the weighted residuals method. And what the weighted residuals method is, is it's another approximation method in which an approximation function is obtained through setting the weighted residual error over the domain to zero. Now, again, if I were to look at that and I was taking this class, I'd say, what? That makes no sense. Show me exactly what you mean. So let's go through what exactly this method tries to do. So let's look at our differential equation for euler bernoulli beams. Now, if I were to take that Q, that distributed load, and move it over to the left-hand side, I get the following, right? Nice and easy. I get an equation, and it's going to be equal to zero. And the whole goal of our approximations was to find an approximate displacement function Y that satisfies this equation. So we say, all right, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assume an approximation function. And even though you guys don't know it, all of our approximation functions had the following form, where it's the summation of i is equal to 1 or i equals 0, whatever you want, over n of ai times phi as a function of x. Now, again, 
doesn't look like you guys are using this because this looks like dog shit, but this is what we were actually been using. Now, if we look here, it has two components. First one, AI. Those are our constant parameters. Those were those A coefficients that we were always trying to find. And the second part here, this phi i, which is a function of x, those are called our trial functions. And even though it didn't seem like we had it, we actually had trial functions. Those were x1, x1 squared, x1 cubed, et cetera, et cetera. So an example, we were usually dealing with something like this, where it's equal to a0 plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. Well, that's the exact same as a0 times phi0 plus c1, or I guess these are... These are supposed to be A's. I changed it at the last second to make it more cohesive. But as we can see, our phi functions are basically just the x1, x1 squared, et cetera, et cetera. All right. And this is why it makes it easier when we get into the finite element formulations, because our trial functions that we're going to use in the finite element formulations, they're not going to be x1, x1 squared, x1 cubed. They're actually going to be uh, a variation of the displacement functions, as you guys are going to see. So. What this method relies upon, oh, and of course, that these must satisfy the essential boundary conditions. So what the method relies upon is this. If we were to substitute our approximation into the differential equation, which we had before, so if I were to go the fourth derivative of our approximation function minus q, and our approximation function was not the exact solution, we would get an answer that's not equal to 0. Remember, this is only equal to 0 if y, our approximation, is our exact solution. So if I substitute an approximation in there that's not equal to 0, or sorry, that's not our exact solution, I will get an answer that is non-zero. So again, unless the approximation is exact, this result will be a non-zero. Now what we do is we call this the residual error, r. So our residual error is simply the fourth derivative of our approximation function minus q. Now, if we remember, our approximation function there, that's a function of x1, which is just x1. That's no big deal. But this is where we had all of those unknown a parameters. So what we're doing in this particular method is we're trying to minimize this error, make it zero to solve for those a parameters. How do we do this? Well, to determine the unknown parameters a, we set the sum of the weighted residual error over the domain d to zero. What does this mean? Well, if I take the integral over the domain, I'm going to take a weighted function, wi, of our, this, and then multiply it by a residual error, and we're going to set it equal to 0. All right, so that's all we're going to do. We're going to solve all of our a parameters using this equation. Now, are the residual? That's easy. It's just going to be our governing equation. In this case of an Euler Bernoulli beam, d squared of y, uh, sorry, uh, the fourth derivative of y minus q. But if we can apply it to a continuum, anything we want. Now the question becomes, what is this weight function? And this is where the method varies. So depending on which weight function we pick, we, we're technically using a different method. So the selection of the weight function, well, there are several variations of the weighted residuals method based on this selection. The first one, we can do the least squares method. I'm sure some of you have probably heard of this before. And in this case, our weight function is selected to minimize the squares of the residuals. In other words, wi is simply the partial derivative of r with respect to ai. And what this basically does is ensures that the derivative of r squared is a minimum. All right? So that one's a little bit more. We don't use that one very much is all I'm trying to say. Uh, the next one. The point collocation method. You guys are thinking, what? We just discussed this. But this is actually a function, or actually one of the weighted residuals method. Now, if we think about it, the weight functions are selected such that the error at very specific points is equal to zero. Remember, when we did the point collocation method, we picked points, and we satisfied that boundary condition, or sorry, that governing equation. So in this case, our weight function is 1 if our point is that specific point we want, or it's equal to zero otherwise. So in this case, that xi, those are the selected points that we do. Now, the final one, which is the big one for you guys, is the Galerkin method. So remember that the Galerkin method is a variation of the res weighted residuals method as it has a very unique uh, weight function. So the weight functions in the Galerkin method are selected equal to the trial functions. So wi is actually equal to phi of i. So if I were to do... Let's say uh, if my equation was x1 for phi1, well, then my w1 is going to be x1. 
and it's kind of hard to see. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an example to help illustrate this. But this is the method we want to know because this is the one that is implemented in the finite element software most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. So let's look at the exact same example that we did before, but this time we're going to solve it using the Galerkin method. So we know that our differential equation is EA multiplied by the second derivative of U, and we said it's equal to P, which is simply negative C times X1. All right, no big deal. What I can do is I can move that uh, C1, C times X1 to the other side and divide by EA. I get that my residual error is this where it's equal to the second derivative of our approximation function plus c times x1 divided by ea. Now, does everyone see where this residual error function came from? I simply divided both sides by ea, and then I moved the cx1 divided by ea to the other side. Is that clear? Hopefully. It's important to know where, where this residual comes from. It's just a rearrangement of our governing equation. Now, we said that we had an approximation function. So let's say that we are going to pick a third order polynomial. Well, that can actually be represented with the following. We got a naught times phi naught plus a1 times phi1 plus a2 times phi2 plus a3 times phi3. So for simplicity, what we're going to do is we're going to select our trial functions, those phi functions, as a function of x1. So ex for example, phi naught is x1 to the power 0, phi1 is x1 to the power 1, phi2 is x2 squared, or sorry, x1 to the power 2 etc, etc. So all those phi functions, those trial functions, we just set them equal to x1, x1 squared, x1 cubed, etc, etc. Now we said that this uh, approximation function must also satisfy those essential boundary conditions. We know it's fixed at the left end, therefore our approximation function at 0 is going to be equal to 0. We know that a naught is going to be equal to 0. Therefore, our updated approximation function is going to be a1x1 plus a2x1 squared plus a3x1 cubed. So these are uh, this is our equation after we satisfy the essential boundary conditions. From here, we can find our weight functions. So remember that in the Galerkin method, these weight functions are selected equal to our trial functions. So if we had our approximation solution as a1x1 plus a2x1 squared plus a3 times x1 cubed, well, our first weight function is going to be phi1. So w1 is equal to phi1, which is simply going to be x1. All right. So I'm going to ask you guys in the chat, what is our second weight function going to be? What's w2 going to be equal to? phi prime, phi2 times 1 x1 squared, yes. So you guys are all correct, just different versions of the same answer. It's going to be equal to x1 squared. If I were to look at my third weight function, uh, w3, it's going to be the last phi function, which is x1 now cubed. All right, so these are our weight functions. Now, the key thing to keep in mind here is that for each phi we have, each phi we have, we have a separate weight function. So even though we have one approximation function, we actually have three different weight functions. All right, so we have one weight function for every phi or trial function that we have. So now that we have these weight functions, we actually have everything we need to solve the problem. Because remember, all we're doing is we're solving the integral over the domain of wi times r dx, which is equal to zero. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, I know what w, or, sorry, I know what r is. Remember, that's just the rearrangement of our governing equation. So I can simplify this equation into the following. wi times r, which is wi times the second derivative of our approximation, plus cx1 divided by ea, all integrated over the length of the beam, is going to be equal to zero. Now, if we were to look above, we have three a parameters, right? We have a1, a2, and a3. Therefore, we need three equations to solve this specific problem. But we only have one, or it seems like we only have one. Remember that if we were to look at that weight function, wi, right there, we have three different weight functions. So what we're going to do is we're just going to substitute w each weight function into this formula to obtain an equation. So for the first one, I'm going to substitute my first weight function in. I get the following equation. The second one, I can substitute my second weight function in. I get the following equation. And the third one, I substitute my third weight function in. I get three equations. Now we're looking pretty good, right? We have three equations here. We know they're all equal to zero. And we have three unknowns. Three equations, three unknowns. We can solve everything. We're, we're, we're looking pretty happy, right? We're having a great time. Well, unfortunately, 
This will give us infinite solutions if we were to solve it just like this. Why do you guys think that this will give us infinite solutions? What do you guys think? Now, this is a really hard question. I'm not going to lie. It's a hard question. So what do you guys think is the problem if we went about it just this way right here? Remember that a naught was equal to zero. So we, so we took care of the essential boundary condition. But you guys are on the right track. We took care of the essential boundary condition, but we didn't account for the non-essential boundary condition. Remember that when we solved this exact same thing using the point collocation method, we needed two boundary conditions. Right now, we only implemented one. So basically, we just tried to solve a second order differential equation with one boundary condition. That's why. So again, the problem is we didn't account for that non-essential boundary condition. Now, the way to incorporate non-essential boundary conditions into the Galerkin method, there's a lot of different ways. If you look at literature, it's a great way to get confused. They have uh, ways where you can substitute other functions in. It, it, it gets to be a mess. The way that I like to do it is integration by parts. And as you're going to see, it's going to work out quite nicely. So let's say that we have our beam here, and we know that the stress at this end, of course, is going to be equal to zero. We came up with a nice relationship between stress and strain. Therefore, we know that uh, for our particular problem, we have a non-essential boundary condition where our displacement function prime at a, function, at a value x1 is equal to L. We know it's going to be equal to zero. So to do this, or to incorporate it, we're going to use integration by parts on our integral. So remember, this was the integral we just tried to solve. We had no luck with it. Now let's try to do it through integration by parts. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this term over here, and I'm going to throw it to the other side. So now i got wi times the second derivative of our approximation function is equal to negative wi multiplied by cx1 divided by ea. So all I did was I took that cx1 divided by ea, threw it to the other side, see you later. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this first term here, which is just wi multiplied by the second derivative of the approximation function, and I'm going to go integration by parts. That'll give us the following equation right here. As we can see, it looks pretty gross. Every time you use integration by parts, it always looks gross. No, no one likes using integration by parts. However, it's valuable in this case because we get this term right here. We see that we have a du divided by dx1. Now, we said that du divided by dx1 at a value of x1 is equal to l is going to be 0. Now, if we look at the integration limits for this specific term, we have x1 is equal to 0. Well, we know it's going to be 0. And we have x1 is equal to l. We know that's going to be 0, too. Therefore, that goes bye-bye. We can say, see you later. We don't care about it anymore because we know that that is equal to 0 due to our non-essential boundary condition. So now our equation becomes really, really nice. It becomes the following, where instead of wi times the second derivative of our approximation function, well, now through integration by parts, we simplified it into the derivative of wi multiplied by the derivative of our approximation function. And the other side stayed the exact same. Now, if we look here, we have our weight function appearing in two different sections. Not too bad. So now that we've updated our equation to account for that non-essential boundary condition, we can start substituting in our weight functions to get our equations. So my first one, I'm going to substitute my first weight function, which was simply x1. And if I were to simplify this, I get a1 times l plus a2 times l squared plus a3 times l cubed is equal to etc. etc. I say, all right, well, there's my first equation. How do I get my second equation? Well, I substitute my second weight function, which is x1 squared. Do this, I get another equation in terms of a1, a2, as well as a3. Finally, I can substitute my third weight function in, which is x1 cubed, and that gives me my third equation. Now from here, I can take this system of equations. I have three equations, three unknowns. I can solve for those a coefficients, and I'm left with this right here. And if you guys remember from the point collocation method, this right here is the exact solution. So we're good to go. Now what do you guys think? So that's really it for this uh, lecture today. How, how are you guys feeling? I, I want some input from you guys. How, uh, not just with this lecture, but the course so far. You guys enjoying it? You guys not enjoying it? Did I put you to sleep? What's uh, the general take so far on this course? Nice? Oh, nice is great. I'm happy to hear that. Very nice. Yeah, no, three hours sucks. Like, three hours really, really sucks. 
I enjoy it. I, I agree that three-hour classes, especially in Monday mornings, no one wants to wake up Monday mornings, 8 a.m. I, I, I'm going to be completely transparent. I did not pick the time for this class. <laughs> I, I want to make that clear. I, I would not do this to you guys. I know that it's uh, kind of mean. That's why I put it uh, that's why I try to put up all the lecture videos. So I kind of lost my voice this week. But if we were to go to E-Class, I try to put up uh, lecture videos of each topic. So let's say that you guys are struggling with a specific method. Let's go to solid mechanics. Let's say that momentum balance is kind of confusing you guys. I try to put in these little lecture videos so that you guys can just review the materials. Hello, and welcome Review back. the material whenever you guys want. So if you guys are saying, you know what, Monday 8 a.m., a little too much, I'd rather sleep in for an hour. I'm trying to make it so that if you guys want to do that, fine. I'll have all the materials posted. Uh, you won't miss anything if you decide to take that extra hour. Remember, tr treat yourselves nicely. Uh, you guys are more, more important than whatever this course is. So, <laughs> Any other comments? Anything you guys want me to change? That's another thing, too. I have the power to change things. Anything that you guys don't like that... Uh, you guys want me to change or my PowerPoints? You guys don't like all the colors? That's something I'm always debating. <laughs> you guys want me to less colors or are the colors fine? I usually find that the colors in the PowerPoints make it a little bit easier to follow along, but that is me. Oh, they are good. Lectures are great. Oh, you guys are just being too nice now. <laughs> all right, and then how about the assignments? Assignments are fine so far. I know you guys have only had one, so it's not... Uh, not too uh, indicative of what's to come. Fine. So when am I going to introduce the final project? I was waiting for that question. The final project will be introduced next week. So at the beginning of next lecture, I'm going to introduce the final project. Uh, basically, how many of you guys have written a conference paper before? Yes, don't worry. All the lectures are recorded, so nothing to worry about right there. All right, so you guys have written some conference papers. Good, good, good. The final project will be kind of like your own little conference paper. What the final project is, it's, it's completely going to... I'm going to have a rubric for you guys next week, I promise. But final project, it's going to be you guys are going to find a problem that you guys want to solve using finite element software. From there, you guys are going to solve the problem using finite element software, and then you guys are going to give me a nice detailed report in the form of a conference paper. So it's not just here are the results, I'm good to go. It's I want a, a thesis or an abstract, sorry. I want an abstract. I want an introduction. I want you guys to tell me what the problem is. That's a big part of research is although we can play around with the finite element method and have fun, we have to have some purpose to it. I can't just go model whatever I want. There has to be some logic to why I'm modeling something. So I want an introduction that says why I'm modeling or why I'm choosing to model the things that I'm doing. And then I want a methodology. So if you guys are modeling concrete, I want you guys to tell me what type of elements you guys are using, what mesh size you guys are using, what material models you guys are using. How are you going to account for things like cracking? stuff like that. And then finally, you're going to have your results section and then conclusions where you guys tell me basically what is the solution to the problem that you guys created. So the, it's very open-ended in that you guys can pick whatever you want. Most people pick their own research. So if you guys are doing research with finite element methods, I would just start working on your research and then you can present that. Now, with that being said, I know that it's hard to pick a project, especially if you're not doing any analytical. Let's say that you're doing a master's and you're, let's say, an MN who's not doing research, or let's say that you're a MSc, but you're only doing lab work. Well, then don't worry. You come talk to me and we can figure out a project together. So don't think that you're on your own picking the project. I'll be here to to help you guys with whatever you guys need. It should, it should be really, really uh, nice. Again, the goal isn't to stress you guys out with a project. It's to kind of uh, get your research going. If you guys are doing FEA studies, well, hopefully you guys can use this class to kind of jumpstart your research and get uh, input for your guys' own models, stuff like that. So hopefully the project won't be too bad for you guys. <laughs> Is there any other questions about the project or anything else in general? No? You guys pretty happy so far? Perfect. So next lecture, which is once we start getting into FEA, uh, at the end of, so we're going to cover these two topics. They're not too bad. And then we're going to get into Abacus. So next lecture, we will use Abacus. So project has to be an Abacus. No. So the assignments, uh, I, and this is something I was debating. The assignments, I want in Abacus, the assignments. And the reason why is when we start talking about plasticity models, 
For instance, the concrete damage plasticity model that we're going to be using in Abacus and what I'm going to be showing you guys, it's not in Open Seas. Open Seas is really nice. It's great, but it's uh, kind of simplistic. <laughs> In that the concrete zero two, well, that's a very simplistic concrete model. Uh, so a lot of the things that I teach in the lecture here are based on abacus. So the assignments are abacus. For the project, any finite element software you like. Sound good? Any finite solve. So if you guys want to use open seas, if you guys want to use vector two, if you guys want to use ANSYs, although that'll make me cringe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit biased towards ANSYs, as you guys will find out a little bit later. But uh, open seas is good to go. Uh, for exams, do we use Mathematica or is it by hand? My The exam, don't worry. You can use Mathematica. And a little spoiler alert, you guys will be using Abacus too. So the final exam is going to be a, a, a lengthy exam. So if you guys have taken an exam with Dr. Sammer before, I like to follow the same format where I'm going to give you guys the exam, let's say on a Monday, and I'm going to make it due, let's say, on a Friday. Now, it's not going to take the full five days. I'm, I'm not a dick. <laughs> but, of course, it's going to be a, an in-depth exam that's going to cover all the topics that we learn here today. So, by topics, I mean things like finite element formulations, isoparametric elements. I'm not going to ask you guys crazy linear algebra proofs. That's just stupid. No one, no one wants to do that. But uh, the key topics in this course, they're all going to be covered in that exam. So, you guys will have plenty of time to do it. But uh, the exam will be fair game. Again, Mathematica, go ahead. MATLAB, go ahead. Abacus, you're going to need Abacus too. <laughs> Hopefully that clears, clears it up a little bit. All right, sounds good. Perfect. All right, and that's it for this lecture. So I'll stick around, of course, for a little bit. But uh, you guys, of course, are free to go. Well, you're technically free to go whenever you guys want. You guys don't have to stick around. But uh, yeah, thanks, guys. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it so far. So it's, a, it's a lot of fun, and it just keeps getting better and better once we actually get into FEA. No problem, guys. You guys have a, a wonderful day. And remember, take some time for you guys, for yourselves, too. I find a lot of graduate students get so caught up in the work and the research. No, no, no. Just sit back, watch a movie, relax. It's how you keep sane. Find out method will drive you crazy later on. <laughs> Anzies for the project is acceptable. Yes, so it was a direct message. So you guys didn't see it, but yes, you guys can use ANSYs if you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, again, I just uh, I, I'm a little biased towards ANSYs, and I'll tell you guys why too. So again, this is just me ranting on. You guys can of course leave, but for me with ANSYs in Abacus, if I were to imp like a model is this: if I input garbage, I'm going to get garbage out. It's very clear that if I input something wrong, I'm going to get an error, and an Abacus is very good at telling you yes. You did something wrong. We can't run this. ANSYs, however, I can input the most garbage you can imagine, and somehow it'll give me an answer. <laughs> so ANSYs is weird in the sense that it's very hard to tell if you did something wrong because it'll always give you an answer. And that's the only reason why. Like It's, it's still a perfect uh, way to show it, but yeah. Uh, so SolidWorks is a good question. So SolidWorks, I'm going to have to look into that. I'll get back to you because one of the things that's going to be key, uh, key here is the implementation of material models as well as the element formulations. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but SolidWorks doesn't really have a lot of options to customize that kind of stuff. Like, I'll, I'll have to look into it. I, I'm, I by no means know anything about SolidWorks, but uh, it's fairly default, no? I don't know. <laughs> okay, perfect. We'll look into it together and decide. Yeah, ANSYs, at least, you can implement different material models, different mesh sizes, and the same thing with OpenSeas, too. So those are definitely valid choices. But uh, sol yeah, I'll, I'll look into SolidWorks and I'll let you, let you know my uh, verdict on SolidWorks. <laughs>